Okay, so uh, stand up here. I'll do my best to stay in the camera area here, but um, so my name is Howard Crampton Jr. and I got on a spiritual path uh, 2004. Uh, just a little background on who I am and my story, which is just a story. But I was raised, uh, I was raised in a good family. I really no complaints, you know. There's arguing stuff that went on with it. It was typical. I was also raised Catholic, and um, when I got into junior high school, it kind of seemed I seemed to question uh, Catholicism, its philosophy. There was just a lot of um, you know fearing God, which which was the big thing, and feeling like I always had to look over my shoulder, scared to do anything, thinking I was going to get a black spot on my soul or something, you know, and um, to be punished for that. So I, I couldn't believe in a God that can be punishing. So I was an atheist for years, and I uh, didn't believe in God. I eliminated God completely from my vocabulary. I didn't say, thank God. I didn't say, God bless you. Uh, God was completely gone. Well, I got into playing music when I was about 14. I'm a drummer, and playing in bands around the same time throughout high school. And at one point, I, uh, my band was playing the whiskey out in Hollywood. And uh, my sister brought a girlfriend of hers to the show. And I met her, and we talked, and hit it off. And her parents introduced, she introduced me to her parents, who gave me the book, uh, The Four Agreements. Well, to digress just slightly, um, I was very, very political. Then I was registered Republican. And if I was going to prove anybody wrong, I did my research to make sure I knew what I was going to talk about. Right? So I can handle any questions or any um, what do you call that? Anything that they're going to try to come back at me with, and I already had an answer to to their question, which isn't right, but I believed, you know, it was the right thing at the time. So they heard me talking about politics and um, liked who I was and the direction I was, was heading. So her mom says, um, "Here's a book called Four Agreements, and the author talks about God in the book, but." Just take what works for you and just regard the rest. And I thought, all right. And at that point, I think I was agnostic at some point within the last couple of years. This is in 2004. I opened up to a higher power. I just didn't call it God. You know, just a higher self or higher consciousness. And uh, I still didn't like the word God, though. You know, so I took the book. I read it. Four simple agreements. And I ran with them. Um, be impeccable with your word. Uh, always do your best. Uh, don't ever assume and uh, don't take anything personally you know pretty simple things in life so I started applying them and it started working for me and I would share them with other people and people wanted more so friends started coming to me for advice and said you should be a counselor you should be a therapist one day and I said I don't know about that I, just, I like this one well one day I, I came across a book um, which I've met plenty of people here who are affiliated with uh, Deepak Chopra and he had a book called How to Know God. So I bought the audio portion because I was driving around a lot. I just moved down to San Diego. I started off uh, doing tile for a friend's uncle. I started off at max pay at 12 bucks an hour, and I couldn't get a raise for another two years. So I was renting room. I had my dog. had my truck came in. I was barely scraping by, you know. But I would listen to Tony Robbins. I was Deepak every single day on my way to work. Well, Deepak in his CD starts talking about nature, you know, and he says, uh, he says, God is like an infinite intelligence. And I thought, ooh, I can resonate with that. He says, how, do, how does a blade of grass know how to grow into a blade of grass? What does an acorn know about growing into the mighty oak? And Wayne Dyer once said, too, um, in reading the Tao, he was referring to the Tao, but he says the first nine months that we're being born, nobody is doing anything, yet nothing is left undone. And I thought, yeah, you know. So I accepted God. I started talking about God. I got to the point where I just didn't care what other people think. I mean, I got tattoos and piercings. I used to have two Mohawks. I should have put a photo in here, but I didn't. Uh, for seven years, you know, I used to have two Mohawks. So. I shouldn't really care about what people think. I didn't care about what people think about me. 
I didn't want people thinking I was a God freak or a Jesus freak, you know. Then I got to the point, you know what, let them think what they want. I read somewhere, someone said, what you think about me is none of my business. And that resonated well. So one thing led to another, more books, more CDs. I went to school, got a bachelor in psychology, um, started taking certification courses by Tony Robbins. And um, as, as a strategic interventionist, I got a certificate in neuro-linguistic programming by one of his top salespeople. Um, after she was a salesperson in New York, and uh, kind of a relationship stuff. And then through my NLP program with New York, I was introduced to Dr. David Hawkins. He wrote the book Power Versus Force. IVI. And IVI, yeah, Truth Versus Falsehood. Plenty. He wrote. He wrote many books, and she uh, printed out this map of consciousness. And um, Scale of consciousness is an arbitrary scale, so zero to a thousand. And we'll talk about that in a little while, but man, that caught my attention. So I started studying it and I bought his book and I read his book and really started getting into his research and consciousness and spirituality tied in with that too. So what I've learned to him with him through him is the power of letting go, the power of surrendering to what we don't have control over, letting go of everything that doesn't serve us anymore. And that's a tough thing because we don't really know what doesn't serve us. And to be honest, there's things that are of the lower mind, so to speak, and they still serve us. If we keep, if a pattern, if a negative pattern keeps showing up in your life, it's still serving you. And people will argue with me to no end when I tell them that, but they do. They love it. They love going back into that negative pattern. And what it is, it's the ego. It's a payoff that the ego gets. You know, it's kind of like when you have a swollen taste bud on the tip of your tongue and you can't stop playing with it even though you want to stop, <laughs> right? There's something about it that keeps drawing you back over to it. Okay. And these are the negative patterns that show up in our life too. So if we want to put a stop to them, we have to acknowledge what is that? What is it that I'm really holding on to? And if we want to ascend in consciousness, and you'll see in the map, you know, different states of consciousness that we want to achieve, what is the block that's holding us there? And at the end, we'll do some questions and answers. Um, so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to run through a few different things. At the end, we'll get to questions and answers. There's a question I'm going to start off first that someone emailed me about a week ago. And he was very persistent in me answering this question for him. And he wouldn't be specific enough. And so I he finally got to a point where he shared enough. He wants to get to this particular state so bad, you know. And uh, you just don't, you don't will yourself to get from point A to point B. There's so much more that goes on in the process. And a big part of that is letting go. So if you have any questions in the meantime, um, feel free to raise your hand. we got three hours. We're going to go about an hour and 20 minutes. We'll take a break. And then um, we'll finish off. What I plan on doing is just getting through the whole map of consciousness in about an hour and 20 minutes. So essentially, we're going to figure out all of the world's problems in an hour and 20 minutes. All right. And then uh, after that, we'll go through some forgiveness and uh, surrender. <clears throat> and we have Carl here at the end who's going to take us through a guided meditation. He's been studying Zen Buddhism for a while. And... Uh, I reached out to him because I was going to do a meditation like that. We talked about this before, so I'll introduce him a little bit later and he'll uh, facilitate a meditation for us. Okay. And uh, William Seeds has joined us too. Thank you, William. Um, if you guys have any questions too, feel free online to put them in the chat box. This is the first time using the system, so bear with me. Um, I'm going to check back in when I can. So, <clears throat> Gloria and Excelsis Theo. <sighs> we can all take a deep breath. <sighs> Gloria and Excelsis Theo. Glory be to thee of the highest. Of the highest. When I say that and I think about that, it brings up a lot. It's... Uh, You can't get any closer to the truth than that. Glory be to thee of the highest. 
whatever that source is, whatever that intelligence is, whether you want to call it God, whether you want to call it Christ, whether you want to call it Buddha or the universe, it doesn't matter. The name doesn't matter. The first um, verse in the Tao Te Ching says that the Tao that can be named is not the eternal Tao. So whatever name you want to call it, for this lecture, um, I'll use the word God. This has been what I've been familiar with. And um, glory be to thee of the highest. This lecture is dedicated to the highest truth. Um, there's another woman who might be showing up here later. She does meditation here at Life Qual Center. <clears throat> and she shared that the truth can really hurt sometimes. Well, the truth hurts when we're not willing to receive the truth. Okay. So I invite you, as we go through today's lecture, to have an open mind. That all information that I share with you today, you do not have to accept as truth yourself. It's only to be held tentative until you experience the truth for yourself. If you do choose, you know, to see the truth within it. Um, as anything comes up, be mindful of your beliefs, uh, of any resistance that comes up, because there's definitely going to be some things that challenge your current belief system. So just be mindful as you feel resistance to it, and if you are willing to set that resistance aside, again, there's nothing that I'm asking you to accept, but just hold an open space and see how it unfolds in your own truth, and your own experience, all right? Uh, so here's an overview. We'll go through the map of consciousness. We're going to talk about kinesiology, muscle testing. It's how Dr. Hawkins came up with the scale. We'll do an exercise around it, too. We'll partner up. And uh, it's just a way to gauge, um, to discern what's truth and what's not truth. We'll go through the levels of consciousness, the map of consciousness, um, what is forgiveness, I'll teach you some techniques in the end, uh, emotional freedom technique, EFT, which is essentially it's uh, tapping on meridian points in the body when you're wanting to move forward with something and there's some nervousness that comes up or stress or tension. You tap on different meridian points and it helps free up the energy in your body. We'll talk about surrender, five steps to letting go, and then we'll have Carl um, do the meditation for us. So... The worst thing that you'll have to experience today is probably my jokes. Uh, if any of those come up. Uh, I'm not the greatest speaker presenter. I've done presentations in the past and they just have to rehearse to make them really, really exciting and it was just too much work. So um, I love to present. I love my work. Uh, I love what I've learned and I love to teach. So. Um, it might be boring if it does, you know, then shift around a little bit. You can throw a pen up at, at the room and, and I might change things up a little bit. <clears throat> so here's some statistics. Uh, I've been talking to some mental health institutions around here, Department of Health Services, and there's a big need for health services everywhere. Um, I realize there's a lot up here. Even uh, just to get insurance to see a therapist through insurance. It's taking anywhere between six to eight months for somebody to get the help that they need. And approximately one in five adults in the U.S., 43.7 um, million, experience mental illness in a given year. Uh, one in 25 adults in the U.S. experience a serious mental illness in a given year that substantially interferes or limits with uh, one or more major life activities. 1.1% uh, of adults in the U.S. live with schizophrenia, 2.6%. With bipolar, 6.9, have at least one major depressive episode. And that's a lot, you know, 16 million people, one major depressive episode. 18.1% uh, of the adults experience anxiety disorders, post-traumatic stress, substance compulsive disorder, uh, specific phobias. And, I mean, even a slight anxiety is just, you know, having a conversation with somebody and not being able to make eye contact or communi communicate you know, effectively with them, especially in relationships. You know, we have a hard time confronting uh, those people that we're really close with because we don't know how they're going to respond. We don't want to feel attacked. Um, lots of stuff comes up. And then 
Melvin adults in the U.S. experience uh, substance abuse disorder. And uh, we see a lot of that with veterans coming out of the military. You know, we don't know how to deal with these emotions, so we drink for comfort and certainty. You know, even at a point where it doesn't feel good, we hurt our, hit our bottom. It's called like, considered a class four experience, something that doesn't feel good. Uh, it's not good for you. It's not good for anybody else. It doesn't serve the greater good. Uh, we've hit our bottom, yet we still stick to these things sometimes, right? So this letting go is how do we get past that? I want to note, too, that these are just statistics. Um, they don't represent the whole truth. You know, where they say one in X amount of babies are dying every second, you know, that's not the truth. You can have a thousand babies die within one hour period. No babies die for weeks on end, you know, and another pop. So they take these numbers and they calculate them. So we got to be open when we hear about statistics about what these people are really talking about. Um, there's a big thing with marketing that uh, that pain gets people to move. We do more to move away from pain than we do to gain pleasure. Uh, it's an NLP uh, topic. So people know that they want the big house, but or all the money or the cars or the relationship, but few people act on it because that's not painful enough where they're at to actually get the things they want. That's limited truth as well. Um, I'll just get past this. There's some pictures. So that kind of just puts into perspective when in every five adults, one in 25 with a serial, serious mental illness, um, one half of chronic mental illness begins at the age of 14, three quarters by the age of 24, and some pictures and graphs of one another. Um, a reason I put that in there too is just to be mindful and compassionate while we're out in the world to really do our best and that's all you can do is to do your best uh, to not judge even if someone's cutting you off on the road and you know inside your mind you're like that son of a you know <laughs> every word comes up you want to run them off the road and all these things and that's fine it's not for you to judge yourself either just don't act on it <laughs> but you realize you know you have compassion because um, we just don't know. If somebody is in a negative state, instead of judging them, which what we're quickest to do is to stop and say, hmm, I wonder where they're at, you know, in consciousness. I wonder where they're at in their mind. I wonder what's gone on in their life, you know, that led them uh, to express this kind of, you know, disorder that they seem to be expressing in the first place. And right then and there, you're going to stop the judgment. And that's just going to open up to a place for curiosity. So here we have our map of consciousness. This is again a uh, arbitrary scale. Sorry, let me try that. Arbitrary scale, zero to a thousand. You can put the scale from negative five to positive point oh eight. You can do one to ten. You can do one hundred to one thousand. Doesn't matter. It's just an arbitrary scale, zero, one thousand. Now. These numbers are logarithmic, so they don't represent energy itself, but they represent life. And logarithmically, so here you have uh, the field increases from 1 to the first power. Once it gets up to 2, it's already going to the second power. And then 3rd to the 30th power, logarithmically, it just increases. So it's not when you jump one level that you just jump one level. Um, energetically uh, in consciousness you're jumping from the first to the tenth power of that level and the higher it gets the more powerful it becomes so we have uh, you see the dotted line here that's an important line that's the level of 200 what that represents is a level of neutrality and consciousness itself so everything below that dotted line um, is a forceful energy it makes the acupuncture system in the body go weak. It does not support life. Um, it's attacking. It's you know uh, destructive in nature. Everything above the dotted line represents uh, truth. It's powerful. It makes the acupuncture system in the body go strong. And how he got these uh, was using kinesiology. So Dr. Hawkins, he, he had the largest psychiatric practice in the United States in New York for three years. He'd always take different lectures. And then what he would do is he would come back and do a quick, you know, kind of Joppa lecture to uh, his staff. 
Well, one day he got invited to a kinesiology um, event, and they were doing muscle testing. Well, he'd been studying this stuff for so long that he was able to see the subjectivity within it. He saw how consciousness itself is reacting to the body, because the body itself is consciousness. And so the body is going to react to what supports life and what does not support life. Uh, maybe you've had an experience where someone tried to sell you something and you just kind of felt resistant and hesitant. You felt that how they were approaching you was less than integrous, you know, and it might be a rip-off and all these things. And you couldn't know that just from looking at the person. You can judge them by the, the cover of the book, but uh, there's plenty of people who look like honest guys dressed up, you know, with a suit and a tie, but something comes off as, you know, I just, no, I don't, I don't trust you. Or there's other people that will sell you something look completely different in a way that you'd never expect them to look in a salesperson, and yet you trust them. You know, so that's the body's reaction uh, to consciousness. So what they do is a doctor will have you hold your hand out, and usually you close your eyes, and they'll put two fingers on your wrist, and they'll ask you, hold your name or just say your name out loud. So I'd say my name is Howard, they push down. And you're supposed to create just a little bit of resistance. So if they push down on the wrist, you're supposed to resist. Or you push on your arm, you're supposed to resist. Now when you say your name, you can stand up here and say your name. If you want to come up here and give us a shot real quick? Just to demonstrate for you, do you do it? Yeah? Okay. I use a sway test, which is leaning forward or backward or backward. Yeah, there's uh, finger things too mm -hmm. and, and whatnot. So we uh, have Benjamin. We're going to ask him to um, say, "My name is Benjamin. My name is Benjamin. Is it okay? Now say your name is Jonathan. My name is Jonathan. Is it okay? So you see, if you're on fault, someone can say, "Well, you know, how do how do I know? It's just he didn't mm -hmm. push it that, right? So we'll practice this here in a little bit. But that's the response to. Um, so I'll tell you what, I'm going to hold something in mind and demonstrate. Actually, let's move in front of the camera over here for everybody. Um, okay, so I'm going to hold a thought in mind. I'm not going to share with them what it is. And um, resist. Okay. Resist. Okay. Did you, were you able to see that at all? Let me do it again. Okay. I'm going to hold my idea in mind. Resist. Okay. And resist. All right. You see the drop? The first thought I had was Jesus Christ. The second one was Hitler. All right. So you got me done. Thank you. Um, we don't have to say things out loud. It's just what we hold in mind. Because there's only one mind. It's going to be shared. That, that one mind is shared with everybody. Uh, of course, the miracle says that there's no thought that we think alone. That could be scary to a lot of people, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> but it's true. Um, that's a different conversation. So what he did was he held in mind, you know, these different words. And so you'll see there's different uh, pillars here. We have the view of God over here to the left. So this is people in the past, you know, up until now. <clears throat> this is how they viewed God at different levels. God being despising, vindictive, condemning. Um, our personal view on life, you know, from the bottom up at these different levels, we can see what our view on life is. The level name itself is the level of consciousness. And then you have your emotion over here, which they are not the same. The levels of consciousness and the levels of emotion are not the same. They're completely different. Um, the level name is almost like, uh, like the ocean. Okay? You have a sea of consciousness. Then you have your fish and your thoughts and your beliefs, you know, that are constantly jumping out and swimming around inside of the ocean. And that's what this represents. Then we have our process. So this is our own life process. This is how we show up and function in life according to all these different levels. Um, power itself is self-sustaining. It's permanent, stationary, and invincible. Force is temporary, it consumes energy, and it moves from location to location. So, of the forceful nature, we know that anything down here, in order for you to 
consistently feel angry, you have to keep thinking about a thought, about something that happened, an event in time, that somebody did something to you, or maybe you did something to something else, or you didn't get something, and it keeps fueling that energy. Well, eventually it exhausts itself, right? You're not angry when you're sleeping. The body's in a relaxed state. You might dream about getting in fights and whatnot, but it's not consistent. You know, it's temporary. Consumes energy moves from location to location. You have to constantly feed into something in order to experience these limited, uh, limited lower levels of consciousness. Power, on the other hand, it is. Always has been, always will be. Love. Peace. Peace is a power that always is. There's nothing you have to do to get to peace. All you have to do is let go of focusing on all that negative bullshit. Yeah. And once you surrender to the higher powers, you let go of all the lower stuff, the result, the natural consequence is peace. When we sit in meditation, people have a hard time meditating. They sit down, they close their eyes, and all of a sudden all these thoughts start coming up, coming up, coming up. But why can't, why do they have a hard time? Because they're focusing forcefully on all the negative stuff. And then we've been conditioned for so long, you know, to focus on stuff. So it's natural. Maybe. I don't know if it's natural, but we do it. It's normal, definitely. Um, so the second that we stop focusing on these, and, you know, when Carl takes us through a meditation later, um, is it 100% guided? Um, oh, maybe I'll throw some, you know. Space guided. in there? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely don't like to put things in a block space where backfire. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. So be mindful as we go through the meditation. You'll see your thoughts going, and then when you stop focusing on them and you focus on space, that'll be your experience. All right. So now we're going to move through. Does that answer questions with this scale of consciousness? All right. So it's kind of at the top. You have the sun radiating. And at the bottom, as you as you walk away from the sun, you know, it gets darker and darker and darker and darker and darker and darker until there's no experience of sun or life itself. Life always is. There's no death. There's only the perception of death, of decay, right? What we call death. Um, which <clears throat> even science says everything is energy moves in form, through form, and out of form. Right? So life always is. It's just, are we experiencing life, or are we blocking life by experiencing and all these negative things that look like death? Um, I think that's it for the scale. Again, any questions? Anybody have any questions? Yeah, it's online. If you Google Map of Consciousness, you'll find you'll find it. Um, anybody online have any questions? I'm going to take a look real quick. Okay. We'll move on. If you have questions, I'll, I'll come back to them. All right. The goal is to relinquish all attractions and all aversions. That's what the Buddha said. You know, what keeps us stuck in pattern? Attractions and aversions. Constantly avoiding one situation and then even the glamour of other situations. Um, a cheeseburger within itself, you know, is not pleasurable, but your projection of the cheeseburger and your experience of it is. If that was, and this is where truth and falsehood come in, of course, a miracle says what's true is always true. And if that was true, that a cheeseburger was pleasurable, everybody would gain pleasure drinking it or eating it, but not everybody does, right? So innately to the cheeseburger itself, there's no joy in it. It's just your own personal experience of joy as you're eating it. But somebody else could have a completely different opposite experience. And so as we go through each of these levels, you will find what your attraction is to holding on to that, whether it is shame or guilt um, or anger or grieving even. Okay. Why it keeps showing up? Why do I keep grieving? How can this keep showing up? Because you're attracted to it. There's a payoff that the ego is getting to it. And that's essentially what it is. 
It's never a thing itself. It's an ego payoff. The ego is fed by negativity. You know, when you can get angry and you can point the finger at someone and you can ugh, get all high and mighty, you know, why are so many people angry or stay angry? Because they feel strong. They feel powerful. Right? They feel they can put themselves above somebody. If I can point the finger at you and say it's your fault, that makes me, that projects my guilt onto you. Now it's not my fault, it's your fault. But everything is projection, so essentially it is your guilt. <laughs> you know? And, um, and the ego feeds, feeds on that. It's like juice to it. Anytime you start getting into worry and fear, doubt, and all that stuff comes up, it's juice to the ego. And the same thing on the attractive side. You know, shoes, the clothes, the women, the men, the sex, power, going to business, to get into a certain position. If I can have this position, I'll have this title. If I have this title, I'll really be a somebody that I can buy that car. And if I drive around that car and I have that title, I'll really be a somebody. You know, and then your identity is all locked up. And then what happens when you're fired and you can't make a car payment? And then you're a nobody and you fall all the way back down to the level of shame and humiliated. And you want to disappear from life, right? So it's not that you have to give up in your dreams and your goals. What it means is you let go of your attachment to the dreams and your goals. Because you'll never ever see a U-Haul following a hearse. Right? <laughs> like I said, the worst thing you're experiencing. Um, so with kinesiology, we have um, Dr. John Diamond, who did behavioral kinesiology, and Dr. George Goodhart, who founded kinesiology. Um, with sports, I believe, sports players. He would study what's going, you know, how come they're breaking legs or ligaments, you know, or spraying this or spraying that, what's going on. He found that if he took a supplement that they were taking and he had them hold it in their mouth and he'd push down on their arm that the arm would go weak. And then he would try a different supplement, a natural supplement, have them hold that in their mouth, push down on their arm and it would go strong. And so he started changing things up. Um, tobacco, actually, true tobacco, real tobacco, um, like an organic raised tobacco will make the acupuncture system go strong. It's just all the crap that they put in cigarettes, you know. Um, some people would hold it to their solar plexus. You can hold something to your solar plexus, push down on the arm, and it would go weak. Um, I wanted to do that today. Actually, I was going to buy an organic banana and then a regular banana with pesticides. And that's how a lot of these people teach in their classes is they'll hold something up in the front of the room and they have people partner up and do these things. But uh, so that's George Goodhart. He was applied kinesiology. Then we had Dr. John Diamond come along. And he thought, well, I wonder if we can do the same thing with our belief systems and our thoughts and just things that we hold in mind. And so he found founded behavioral kinesiology. So it's not necessarily having to hold the substance in your mouth or to your solar plexus, but what we did holding a thought in mind and how that affects the body's acupuncture system. Um, some call it muscle testing. If you've ever been to the doctor and the doctor wants to test for an organ that's strong and weak and they have you hold out your arm and they put their hands and in acupuncture, if you ever had acupuncture, um, they use the behavioral kinesiology form where they'll have you hold your arm out and they'll put their hand over certain parts of your body to see where they want to, they need to stick the needle and see what organ is weak because it's always tied to an emotion. Now, uh, if you want, you guys want to do this real quick? I want to practice? Yeah. yeah? So go ahead and partner up, and then you can come up here with me. Uh, for you guys online, we uh, well, I'm going to show you a technique real quick. Let me get my camera back up here for you. If you're interested in doing this online, there's a few different techniques. Um, what Benjamin said is you can stand straight and just take a deep breath. Some people will say drink water, but you uh, just allow your body to relax, and you want to always ask a question in the form of a statement. So I think I got some notes here. I got to take a look at too. Um, asking a question in the form of a statement. So instead of saying, "Is this good or bad?" you would say, "Well, we'll start off with our name." You can say, "My name is," and see which way your body falls. And then you say, "My my name is," and pick a fake name and stand, and then see which way your body falls. 
Another way is you can use what they call the O-ring, where usually your ring finger, because it's, it's the weaker finger, your index finger is too strong, we use it more often. You take your ring finger and then your other finger, kind of hook and push, pull through. So you can test, say, my name is Howard, my name is Jonathan, and you play around with it. If you really want to practice, there's um, a way that you can't practice just looking around your room and you can say, I'm looking at a table, I'm looking at a chair. And you look at the color of the wall, the wall is white, the wall is blue, and you can gauge how much pressure, because you really don't need a lot of pressure. Your one finger just needs to break through that, okay? Um, another way, and this will be the last one to show you guys, is um, you can resist too. So you just lock your fingers together and then use your other two fingers to try to break open those. So again, because you're only using this, you know, you're not trying to, you know, rip something open. It's just uh, you want to test to see how much pressure you really need, which is only like a couple ounces of pressure to keep it closed and try and open it. Uh, same thing with the muscle testing. What we'll do here too before we start is the thymus thumb. What happens with kinesiology a lot where people have a hard time um, gauging an accurate answer. There's many things. A lot of times partners and spouses, for some reason, their chi is off. So they'll, they'll get different answers. Um, if you find yourself getting inaccurate answers, Dr. John Diamond talked about the thymus thumb. And what you do is you just pound, not hard, just lightly on the thymus, um, right here around the center of your chest. And you say, you think of someone you love, hold in mind someone you love, and go, ha, 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 And that will readjust um, the acupuncture system. So sometimes you could say, my name is, you would say, my name is Carlton, and it'll go weak. You say, my name is Jonathan, and it goes strong. So, you have to shift, so you go, ha, 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 and that should balance everything out. If you're still getting inaccurate answers, it might be that your partner and yourself are not compatible, okay? So let's go ahead and uh, we'll stand up real quick. Now, we'll do A's and B's, so we'll do A, you're an A person, you're an A person, B person, B person. The A people will be the tester, and you guys will be the subject. The subject pulls their arm out, okay? So stand somewhere you have some rooms, and um, you're just going to ask the person, you're going to have them say their name, and then when you say resist, you want to push down fairly quickly, okay? So I'm going to have them say, my name is Benjamin, my name is Benjamin, resist, okay? And then my name is Carlos, my name is Carlos, resist, okay? So I'll go ahead and try that, say resist. You want to, yeah, tell them, say, after they say the name, say resist, and then push down the arm immediately. There you go. And then have them say a fake name. Okay. You feel a difference? Yeah. Now the Bs will switch to A's, so the Bs are the test thirds and the A's are subjects. <laughs> <laughs> and those of you online, if you're doing any of these things, again, you can just say, my name is, if you're doing this one, see which way you fall forward. My name is Jane. I'm Mary. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think of <laughs> <laughs> Is everyone getting accurate answers? Yeah. Now try to hold something in mind. So we'll go. We'll stay with the B people as the testers, the A people as the subject. Uh, the tester holds something in mind, and the A people hold your arm out. You're going to think of something. Um, I can't tell you what to think of because then uh, mm -hmm. suggestion. So just think of something in mind, and then say resist when, as you're holding it in mind. And then think of something which is the opposite of what you thought about. So there's going to be a positive and a negative. And then try it again. Did you want to try it on me? I can. Yeah. Okay. 
<laughs> My name is John. John. That's that one. And I woke up in the morning. That's funny. I said Obama and Trump, and Trump is strong. But Obama was not. Oh, really? Interesting. Uh, hmm. Yeah, no, no. well, you know, what, what happens too is, um, so here's how it'll work. When we're gauging people, we're also, if you're calibrating a specific person, it's important to ask clearly what part of that person. So is it Obama the president? Is it Obama the mm -hmm. husband? Is it Obama, you know, the brother or, you know, different things? And this is how... You know, we can cal yeah. people calibrate things sometimes that they use as a scale to calibrate a certain person and they get different answers. Um, it depends on what you're calibrating about that, you know. Yeah. Do you mind if I take no. back on that? Absolutely. A little bit? Well, no, I mean, oh. and, uh, just an explanation of what we're doing here with the community already. Sure. You guys want to listen to, uh, and you guys can sit down if you're finished. Just from my own experience in terms of the, uh, what we're doing with this and, and why it's important is because, like I was saying earlier, we're trying to find the truth. And sometimes that truth is subjective, but a lot of times our subconscious knows the truth, but we consciously don't know. So what we're doing is we're bypassing your conscious mind that thinks it knows everything and try and get to the subconscious mind, which actually does, and it keeps a record of everything that's happened in this life and in past lives as well. So you can access that information through kinesiology and get the truth, more or less, and get, you know, 90-something percent truth. Uh, and sometimes you'll have to do it a couple times to, to really know, but you're asking these questions in a way to get to the subconscious mind who knows all, and which is connected to the infinite mind, which knows all as well, which is at the top of that scale. So by bypassing it with kinesiology, we're trying to get the truth of ourselves and get to know a little bit more about you know what we're doing here and why we're doing it and this gives us a little bit more confidence to be more certain about the changes that we're making and things that we want and, and don't want in our lives so it's basically a, a way of clearing karma and clearing uh, just clutter so that we can get to that essence and then we can move forward so if you say hold a, uh, a stone in your hand so to speak and it has a, a, a positive energy for you then, and you ask, is this stone a good balance for me? And you can either sway or muscle test, and it will tell you yes or no. And if it's not, that just means that the energy in that stone is not effective for you now, maybe later, but not now. And that's a way for your body to tell your mind this is true because we don't really know truth right? otherwise. Okay. Yeah, thanks. I'll well, share that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it is. It's, it's important. It's um, Again, only the truth is true, but facts are always changing. Okay? So where we're at now is not where we're going to be later. And what truth is, people say, well, what is truth? Truth is content within context. Content within context. So we can look to slavery, you know, years and years ago. And from, um, you know, we look back on slavery this way. Now that evolution of humanity has evolved, so much, and we look back and we, we say that that was bad and that was evil and that was all these things. Well, bad and evil and all good or bad, right or wrong, those are all subjective. You know, that's since there's no good or bad, right or wrong, it just is what it is. If you're looking from the slavery time and you're looking this way, you see at that time you had um, Vikings and warriors who raped and pillaged and, uh, you know, we take no slaves, no women, children, men, you know off with everybody says. So then comes a the time where they say, you know, please spare me. Spare my spare my child at least. You know, take me, spare my child, let my child live. You know, so then they get thrown in the slavery. So what's good or bad? You see, content within context is going to change everything. And this is where people get mixed up with talking about truth and this is true and that's true. Well, no, it's, what most people present is facts. And facts are going to change, just like Stephen Hawking's black hole theory, which stood true for 
30 years, it's a fact for 30 years until he disproves his own theory. You see, so what he was talking about even with the stone, where something might not be healthy for us now, might be healthy for us later. Might be karmic factors, you know, might be physical um, factors, we don't know. Mental factors, there's a variety of different factors. So we see how um, the doc created the map through discernment of truth and falsehood. Now we finally have a tool to discern truth and falsehood. For many years we didn't. We just had to take people's words and then learn through experience, our own personal experience. Now we finally have a way in evolution to discern truth and falsehood. Um, what decision do I make? You, you might be faced with, uh, I have two jobs, um, opportunities. I got this one which seems uh, pleasurable, but it's not making as much money, and this one that makes as much money, but it seems like a lot of work and a lot of detail, and I'm kind of stuck on which one to to take. And you can ask in the name of the highest good. And that's another thing, too, I forgot to mention. Usually before, not usually, always before we muscle test, is you want to ask permission first. Permission to consciousness. Because there's certain things, and uh, which, you know, I know most of you, and um, a couple people on the broadcast to bring up the slavery issue. You know, if I was in front of a whole lot of other people that I didn't know in a big, large conference with people all over the world, that might not be the best thing to start off with until they knew me and my work first, correct? So we always ask permission. Do I have permission to um, inquire into this thought I'm holding in mind? Do I have permission to inquire into this thought I'm holding in mind? If you're by yourself, if you're most of that to me. If you say yes, then you ask the question, statement and then he gets your answer because there are certain things that we might not be that we're not supposed to know all the time for whatever reason and we don't question it you just trust that okay this is the answer that I got and I'm okay with it and I'm gonna move forward okay um, all right critical point analysis that was with the muscle testing and the exercise so what we do when we're identifying a problem, <clears throat> and I think the next slide will start going into different states, critical point analysis. It's the least effort that makes the largest impact. So where in consciousness, if there's this pattern that's showing up for me in my life, where in consciousness is this, is this problem or is this block or am I blocked? And instead of, you know, going to yoga and eating raw foods and running five miles a day and then going and, you know, doing these breathing exercises and we're like doing all this stuff and we're exhausted at the end of the day. It seems like nothing's really working still, even after all this stuff. Where is the critical point? What is it that I need to do? How do I need to surrender? Then you find that doing the yoga, doing the raw foods, healthy foods, juicing, meditation, whatever it is, that's just all contributing towards your well-being experience in your life. And to get the block, we understand where is this emotional block in consciousness. And then once you identify it, you can ask for guidance. Please show me, or what would you have, in the Course of Miracles, it says there's three questions to ask. God, what would you have me do? Where would you have me go? What would you have me say? So in order for me to let this go, where would you have me go? Uh, what would you have me do? What would you have me say? And you listen without agenda. Openly. You can get the sign on a license plate in front of you or in a sticker on a car or a billboard driving somewhere. Someone can call you out of the blue and say something with the answer that you've been looking for. I'll tell you uh, some things that you can shut up for this event. I mean, I moved up here and I didn't have a whole lot of money uh, for too long, and I, I've been going around and <clears throat> I'm kind of unemployable. I have a hard time working for other people um, because of my flexibility and what I like to contribute to different programs if I see it a different way of helping somebody, and these people don't allow it. So I've been going around and talking to different places, asking for work or to teach classes, lectures, any of these things. And um, Life Qual was the only response that I had got that invited me to, to do a workshop. Well, there's rent for the room. And at that point, I was overdrawn on my bank account, and I had no money even for the deposit. And so I went into prayer, and I prayed. I said, God, I, 
I'm perceiving lack. I know that you did not create lack, but it's showing up in my experience. I acknowledge that there's a belief in lack and scarcity I have in my mind. I'm, I turn this over to you, and I ask my mind to be healed. And for you to show me the truth instead of what I'm looking at. Even when you pull out your wallet and you're looking through your wallet and you only see X amount of dollars, you're not looking at the truth about your nature. You're just looking at the effect of your beliefs in your wallet. Even if you have money in your bank account or more money in your pocket or wherever you stash it, we are abundant. So we have to look for abundance. So I went there and I asked, God, help me to see the truth instead of this. Help me to recognize um, my inheritance from you, you know, my nature, being whole, happy, complete, abundant, healed, safe, all these things. And so uh, a lesson came up, a uh, daily lesson from my mentor, and I was reading through it. And she was talking about, you know, when we're looking for work, you know, make it known to everybody that you're looking for work. You never know who knows somebody who can help you out. So I wrote on the Facebook group page, I said, hey, I finally got this opportunity, but they're asking for this much, and I'm open for suggestions on what to do and blah, blah, blah. So my mentor emails me and says, um, my husband and I want to tithe the $75 for the deposit. And just to get you started, I thought, great, thanks. <laughs> you know, like, already, pray right there, answered. Then I get another email for the balance of it. Another woman sent me an email and said, I saw that Robin and Terry tithe the 75. She said, I want to tithe the rest, uh, the balance for you. And I thought, wow. You know, at the same time, I was going through a lawsuit with a car that I bought earlier this year, and I hadn't gone to court yet. And I was representing myself, but I went through Legal Shield, uh, and they wrote a letter, and um, so I would just call them when I would get feedback, and they'd say, "Well, don't bend, you know, just stick with your guns." And the whole time I stood in integrity, 100% of the time. Not once did I try to get more out of them than I asked for, until it came to a point where I asked for an extra grand, saying, "If this thing is going to carry on, I'm still making payments on the car and all this stuff." <clears throat> Talked to the attorney try to lowball me a couple of times, and finally, like, the third lowball, and I got pissed off. Like, I got authentically angry. <laughs> and I told him, I said, you know, you talk to your sales guy, who I started talking to when we first started going through this, and he'll tell you how straight my story has been since day one. I said, don't, and I was pissed, I said, don't BS me, you know, I'm not trying to screw you guys over. All I'm asking for is what we've put into it. And I'm asking for an extra gram because I don't know how long this is going to go on. Oh, I know. You know, you're a good guy, blah, blah. I got a phone call a couple of weeks later saying, okay, we'll settle for the first amount minus the extra gram. We'll just go ahead and get settled on that one. Phew. Right? So things come up. You trust what you ask. So find that critical point, you know. So with... Um, with the financial thing, I had to sit and I had to, had to ask, where is this critical point with this lack of finance is constantly showing up in my experience so it can finally stop and I can get past this and live the life that I'd like to live, you know? And so you sit in peace, you can muscle test. <clears throat> A lot of times you don't even need to. You can just look at the map and you know through the qualities that are on the map. Let me, uh, let's see here. Pull this back up. You can look at the different qualities and know where your block is at. Even if it was a relationship issue that you're experiencing, you can say, where is this relationship, this problem with our relationship being experienced? Does it seem demanding? <laughs> if it is, it might be at a level of pride. Right? Um, am I fear, is, is one person growing and the other person not? Maybe they're at a fearful state. You know, And so you sit. You ask for guidance, you can find where this is, you can use kinesiology, muscle testing to identify where you're at on the scale. And then once you find out where you're at, you can ask those three questions. What do I do? Where do I go? What do I say and to who? And you'll always be guided. There's always an answer, it's just whether you're listening or not. If you don't feel like you're getting an answer, ask again. If you still feel like you're not listening, then let it go. Trust that God, Source, heard you. And then just go on, and you'll get that answer again, whether it's in your car, on the radio, on the billboard, wherever it's at. <clears throat> okay, so, how are we at with time? 
All right, we're at 12 o'clock. Okay, so here we have a uh, level of shame. This is the Bob. Our view on God is that God is despising. Uh, let me close my thing here. Get some notes. Um, God is despising. We're miserable at this level. We tend to be humiliated. And the process is elimination. So I pulled up the scarlet letter. I thought that was profound. You know, back then, shaming people. Having them wear a woman for a big red letter. Walking around town so everybody knew who she was and what she had done. And what does she do? She hangs her head. So here's physiologically, you know, your shoulders are sloused, your head is sloused. You feel embarrassed. When you feel embarrassed, you want to say face. So then we're not even in public anymore. We're scared to go around anyone. Borrowing money from people a lot of times. We've borrowed so much and we haven't given back. We feel shameful that we haven't given back. Soon we stop hanging out with our friends or our family or whoever we borrowed from. Right? We just that's that embarrassment. That's that level of shame. Um, I have a note here in the late eighteen hundreds to well into the nineteen hundreds. Um, Europeans created human zoos in cities like Paris, Hamburg, Germany, Antwerp, Belgium, Barcelona, Spain, London, Milan, lots of places. Uh, these were popular human exhibits where whites went to watch black people who were on display. The black people were usually forced to live behind gates and in cages similar to animals and uh, similar animals in the zoo today. Wearing a dunce hat when we're in school. Right, Jimmy? That was bad. Put on the dunce hat, go sit over in the corner. We love to publicly humiliate and shame people. You know? Shame on you for even thinking that. And then we take on this shame like, whoa. And we get stuck. A lot of people get stuck there. Yeah, that is that was really bad. And we start judging ourselves about it. God, well, I was stupid and I shouldn't have done that. And what's my problem? And that's where we get stuck. You know, instead of forgiveness. What is, you know, we do the best that we can with what we know. Even if we know intellectually to do something differently, we know about it, but we don't know with the capital K. We've heard about doing differently. How many of you know that you should be doing something different than where you're at, but you still haven't yet achieved that thing? You haven't gotten yourself there yet. Right? Even on smaller goals, if it's just I've been wanting to run five miles instead of four miles, why aren't you doing that yet? Well, I know about it, and then I know that I should be doing this, but you haven't. Been. So we know about doing anything, so you can't judge yourself for not having achieved that yet. Because you only have an awareness about that. So you forgive yourself. Say, I did, I'm doing the best that I can, and until I really integrate that, and I love that word integrate, integer. <clears throat> integer as a mathematic word is a whole number. So integrity. When we stand for integrity, we include the whole. When we do the best that we can, when we've integrated something, we don't only know it, we don't only express it, because anybody can read a book and reiterate some information, but now you've become it. So what you said earlier about, about just being here, I'm just, I'm just here, you know, it was perfect. That's all that we can do is just be. You shall come to know them by their fruits, and you yourself, as it says in the Bible, something along those lines, right? So just be the best that you can be. Uh, I found this other photo. It's kind of funny. Shaming. Won't come to court. Won't pay my fine. The judge Scooby ordered me to hold this sign. You know? <laughs> Public humiliation. And we feed on that. Why? Because that gives us power. Right? If we can publicly shame somebody, we can put ourselves above them and we can look like we're the better. Right? Next, we have uh, guilt. <clears throat> vindictive. God is vindictive. He hates you. You know, that's kind of like God with the lightning bolts coming out of his eyes, depicted with the lightning bolts coming out of his eyes. You view him like his life is evil. Blame. Point the finger, and the process is destruction. Now remember, I don't know if you probably heard this, when you point the finger, you have three more pointing right back at you. Right? So, 
guilt, where we see guilt in the world, everything is just a projection. This whole world is a projection. Me standing up here is a projection of your beliefs. Everything that you're listening to today is a projection of whatever you held in mind and kind of what you believe to be true or what you are learning along your spiritual evolutionary path. And here is just another reference for you to believe that it's true or not true, you know, however you take that in for yourself. So even guilt, guilt is projected out because the ego can't see itself as guilty. I point to your head, it's not really your head, but um, when we get into our head, we see it seems a lot of times, you know, but uh, it's the ego. The ego cannot be wrong and the ego cannot be guilty. And so what it does is it projects its guilt onto everybody else. But guess what? We are all one. This is the sonship, you know, as Christians talk about it. You know, but even the Buddhists as well. You know, one mind. One consciousness. This is why no thought is ever sunk alone. So, your guilt that you project onto somebody else is yours. And what I like my mentor, she has a uh, metaphor about bowling balls. It's like you're carrying around bowling balls. And when someone shows up in your life and they do something that you don't like, right? instead of judging that person for doing something, what they're doing is they're pulling out a bowling ball from your sack and saying, hey, here's what's going on in your life right now. Are you, are you willing to take a look at it? I'm showing up for you. You're projecting onto me guilt or anger or whatever's showing up, and I'm showing up for you. I'm playing a role that you asked me to play. So here's this thing. Are you willing to keep it and hold on to it and judge me for it? Or are you willing to look at it, thank it for how it served you in the past, and finally put it down and let it go? Does that make sense? Yeah. So our whole experience is these people show up for us, either as gifts and as blessings. Well, they all show up as gifts and blessings, just no matter if you want to see them that way or not. But they either show up happy or they show up unhappy. They show up unhappy, you say, hmm, there's persons showing these. It's a whole metaphor of being a mirror. Everybody's a mirror, right? This person is showing, they're reflecting back to me what I already hold in mind. So thank you. Thank you for showing up for me that way so I can finally ask, hey, I still have this belief in, in blank, God, I'm willing to turn it over to you, and I ask for that part of my mind to be healed so that I can see happiness and more abundance and more love and more joy and all these things. You know? <clears throat> so we do. We project evil out at this level of guilt onto the whole world. Guilt mongers, you know, just like shame, people love to make other people feel guilty. Um, it's like a, a little kid, you know, and they say, come give me a hug, and the little kid holds on to their mom's leg, and they say, no. And they go, and they start making that sad face, oh, I pretend I'm so calm, so a little kid will feel guilty and go up and give them a hug, only if they knew what they were doing, right? <laughs> you're helping this little kid, you're programming him to feel guilty for not wanting to give you a hug. I have my niece, she's, um, God, how old is she, four years old or something? And even younger, she, and even today, she's real hesitant and going to give people hugs, even family members. You know, all my sisters and brothers show up and she's adorable, so they all want to hold her and squeeze her and Sarah kind of hold on to her mommy's leg for a while. And then when she feels comfortable, but her mom has never ever forced her, even family members, to say, go give them a hug. And her belief, which rightfully so, you know, as they say a lot of uh, um, molestation happens within the family. So, what would happen if that was the molester saying, come give me a hug, and the kid saying, no, 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 and you're the parent saying, you go give your uncle a hug, you know, you're not listening to your child. You know? So we have to accept where they're at, what they want to do, and what they don't want to do. Now, you'll know over time whether it's just a insecurity, self-destructive behavior within them, or if it's a genuine thing. Kids naturally tend to open up to people, you know. And so do we. So what we do is, you know, we think that God is vindictive, um, we put evil, um, we see the whole world painted as evil, and certainly we can look out to the world and see a lot of evil doing, but that's our own belief that we have to do the work on, even with all this ISIS stuff that's been going on. We can give it meaning, 
but first lesson of Course in Miracles, what I see from my room on this street has no meaning. Very first lesson. What I see from my room on the street doesn't have any meaning. People go, what do you mean this doesn't have any meaning? You know? But what is this table? And then the second lesson says, <clears throat> what I see from my room down the street, um, down the taller of my house, wherever it is, has all the meaning that I've already given it. So what is a table? What is a bowl if I had a bowl on the table? People say, well, it's for eating, or it's for stashing things, and, or it's for storing, or it's for this, and it's for that. And that's where the first lesson, it's not what it is. Second lesson, it's all what you've already given meaning to. So as we see people, we see our situations, we see things going on in the world, that has no meaning. And we've already given it all the meaning that we have. Therefore, if an opportunity comes up and someone shows up for you a certain way, you're going to judge them and you're going to miss out on an opportunity because you've already given that person all the meaning that you've given them. And I'm not saying this is easy to do, to shift. You know, but when we can pause a moment and uh, not react, Typically, we tend to react, but we can learn just to start biting our tongue before we react and say, okay, you know, give me a minute. <laughs> I'm going to just go pray for a second and I'll be right back. <laughs> yeah. And then you come back and you see how it how it unfolds. But typically, when you ask for prayer and you ask for guidance, these people are going to be eliminated for your life or they're going to change, you know, to be in your experience. Um Let's see, the ego doesn't want the responsibility, feelings of guilt. Um, okay, so then we experience feelings of guilt for not being or doing the things that we should be, you know, so again, more judgment on the self. Um, if we're drinking and we think we shouldn't be drinking, start judging yourself for drinking. I, I know I shouldn't be, I'm on the spiritual path and I haven't quit drinking yet, or smoking or overeating or eating, whatever. You start judging yourself for how much money you spend, your thoughts about others um, and yourself. Um, thinking about what somebody said in the past. We feel guilty for saying no a lot, don't we? We tell somebody no, and we, we can't tell somebody no. We get into situations where, God, why the hell did I commit to doing that thing? Um, another colleague, I guess you can call him, of mine, uh, he's a speaker as well. He was talking about the power of yes and saying yes, and then he talked about the power of saying no. And, uh, Oh, no, 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 this was Brian Tracy. I was listening to Brian Tracy. And so he did this presentation one time. He was talking about the power of saying no. And this woman stands up and goes, oh, my God. She says, I've been practicing that for so long. I say no all the time. And he's thinking, great, I'm sure people would really love you, right? <laughs> and she said, no, 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 no. She says, what I do, uh, she says, for example, at my kid's school, you know, I'm on the parent-teacher uh, conference thing. And they'll ask me to do something, and I'll tell them no. And then I go home, and I think about it, and then I say, can I do this? And if it's something that I can't do, then I'll call them back and say, you know what? Yeah, I, I can go ahead and do that. So instead of that moment and feeling guilty for committing to something you really don't want to commit yourself to in the first place, you know, it's saying no, and then thinking about it, and if you can do it, then you can call them back and say, sure. You know, I can do this um, and again, going back to that black spot, on your soul, so you're walking around and, you know, God sees that. Or if you're like me, then God sees that. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Apathy. <clears throat> okay, view on God. God is condemning. He wants to punish you. Right? He wants to keep you down. Life at this point is hopeless. Uh, our emotion is we're in despair. And then abdication. Hopeless. This is a big thing. This is, uh, well, we've been trying things for a lot of time, and nothing seems to work. You know, we get this apathetic state. Resources are still available to us. People offer their help and support and everything. Nope, we can't accept it. Nothing works. You know, I can't help myself. Nobody can help me. I've done all the work. I've done everything. 
there's just no hope. These lower levels, shame and guilt, <clears throat> the level of shame with this mental health thing that we brought up earlier, tend, people tend to um, commit passive suicide. The levels of energy are so low. Uh, people at that level will drink themselves to death, no nutrition, they're not eating, you know, it's just kind of a barely getting by um, kind of a thing. They just don't want to live. You know, that level of energy is so low, and then that guilt is just so strong, too. They just drink themselves to death, you know, or drugs or anything else, too. At that level, too, of shame between shame and guilt, that's where a lot of murder, you know, these people in the East, these uh, terrorists and all that stuff that's going on. That's a level of guilt that's projected out onto us saying that they are the ones that are guilty. And remember, if everything is just a projection, who's the one that's feeling guilty? Now, these poor innocent people, if you want to look at them that way, how did they turn out to be that way? They're not born that way. We're all born into a certain level of consciousness. But these people are programmed their whole entire lives to believe that this is what they have to do in the name of God. And then you have society around them, so then the, the beliefs are reinforced by looking around them and watching everybody do the same thing. It's the same case with the Jim Jones people going down to Costa Rica and drinking the punch. He took these people away from main society, popular society, moving them down where they were secluded, and he can tell them whatever they wanted, because if he can sell just one person, if he talked to another person, saw somebody else doing it, there was their reinforcement. Well, it must be true, because everybody else is doing this. Right? I had a friend, of, a friend of mine tell me, doing, doing what I do in these lectures and stuff too, that, that I have a cult. <laughs> but I'm a cult leader and all these things. And I said, that's fine. You guys believe whatever you want. Said, but you can just look to the nature of it. You know, are people being creative, you know, and supportive of life, or are they destructive? So however you want to, to look at that, call it whatever you want. You know, it's your belief. You're the one that's holding on to it, not me. Um, at the level of apathy, people get put on suicide watch now because the level is a little bit higher. This is why there's no good or bad according to the scale. Doctors will get you to progress along a similar scale when you go seek help and therapy. They'll try to get you out of shame and into a level of apathy. At a level of apathy, you're on suicide watch because now you're more prone to, because uh, you're helpless, as an active suicide. So cutting or shooting yourself or hanging yourself or any of those things. Uh, so they're put on strong watch because they just feel so hopeless and helpless that nothing is going to work. Um, the process is just giving up, renouncing, you know, everything, your your belongings, your life itself, no hope left. Um, life itself lacks meaning and there's no purpose. Some countries that you can see that are really poor around the world is Uganda, Democrat. Uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Zimbabwe, Angola, a lot of these African cultures. That consciousness, they're born into that low of consciousness that the survival rate is, um, I think, like 13 or 16 years old or something like that. They believe people who live to be about that old, maybe 18 if you're lucky, and then, you know, 30 or 40 if you're really, really lucky, which has nothing to do with luck because we certainly see people come out of these countries, you know, what was it about them that nobody else was doing? And when we talk about statistics, when people start getting on statistics about, you know, what is and what works and what doesn't work, even if you're talking about diet, food, and, and eating healthy or drinking and all that kind of stuff, is if one person lived a full life and did all those things, so there's karmic consequences, you know, but what was it about him that he succeeded? What was it about Roger Bannister? that broke the four minute mile when physicians and everybody else was coming out telling them it's physically impossible, you're going to rip tendons and ligaments and everything else, you're going to break bones even trying. But he did it, right? What is, for me, I want to know what that one person out of a million did to succeed. I can give a shit, pardon my French, what statistics have to say about anything else. And I will learn the best that I can to understand what that was so that I can lead a life that I want to live, not what other people think that I should live. Um, okay, grief, 75. This is the breakthrough level. 
If we can get people into a state of grief, we can get them to cry. If we can get them to cry, we know that now they're starting to express emotion. They're not just suppressing it for you now. You know, so God at this point in history, you know, or even today, people at this life, God is disdainful. Life is tragic. You see the little puppy walking down the street. Oh, happy and cheery because you finally got out of the backyard. Someone goes by, oh my God, he's going to get hit by a car, that poor thing, you know. Remember that everything's what it is, no good or bad, right or wrong. Nothing has meaning. So what is this little dog that's just prancing down the street? Is it happy or is it sad? Well, it depends on where you're at in consciousness, emotionally, to project that onto the situation, you know. Uh, regret. At this place, I have tons of regret. I worked 30 years for this company just for them to fire me or lay me off the way they did. And they kept this other person who had little experience and blah, 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 blah. I built my whole life around this thing only for it to turn out as it did now. On a health level, I ate healthy. I did yoga. I meditated. I prayed. How did I get cancer? You know? Grief. Or any disease that comes up at that point. They start grieving. No meaning. There's regret in everything I did. I shouldn't have done that. That was stupid. I wasted my whole life where I could have been doing this and having fun and blah, blah, blah. Relationships, if we're in one, but somebody else shows up and we think I could have been with this person, but I stayed with you. Now you're being a jerk. You know, I just went back to the other person, blah, blah, blah. Grief. Regret. Despondence. The perception of limitation, seeing things not for what they are, but how we see them. Right, the limitation, building something for so long only for it to end abruptly, right? uh, unworthy of notice by God. That's how we feel. God thinks about us at this point. Um, dis you know, discouraged, dejection. The upside, again, the release of emotion for apathy. Um, we just got a couple more. We'll take a break. Fear. Um, our view on God at this point. God is punitive. Our view on life is frightening. We experience tons of anxiety and we tend to withdraw. So when we're at a state of fear, we have ideas of things that we would like to do, but we're so scared of doing anything. We're scared to make a decision. If I make a decision over here, what if this happens? But if I don't make it, then this is going to happen. And if I make this decision over here, what if that happens? You know, and all these phobias start coming up. And then we get stuck because we can't move anywhere. Even thinking about something brings anxiety. We go to bed thinking about, well, what's going to happen if I don't make a decision? What's going to happen if I do make the decision? I don't know what to do. I don't have any help. Anxiety. We can't sleep. And then we just tend to withdraw from society. So. <laughs> um, let's see. Well, that. Let's go out of here real quick. I'm going to play a video. Um, you know what, let's go ahead and take a quick break, and then I'll come back and we'll finish the rest of the map. So if you guys in the restroom, we got water, we got snacks over there. Feel free to help yourself with all that stuff. We'll come back, finish the map, talk about the other things, and we'll have Carl and Scott as the meditation. Maserati. Maserati. That's uh, MC Stradale. So it's faster than the GT. It's got a roll cage inside of it. Just a few more horsepower than the Gran Turismo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I test drove one. Um, let me check in here real quick with everybody. So, chat. How you guys doing here on the uh, live broadcast? Are you able to raise your hand? Um, I can try to unmute you guys, too. There we go. If you unmute your microphones, you guys are able to talk.
Hello. If you guys are there, say hi. If not, that's okay too. Um, I'm going to walk around here to the other side of the laptop. If you have any questions, feel free to shut out. Your microphones are on. I'll type that in the box. All right. Yeah. Right down. So, are we on pause? Um, that thing's still going. I should actually get this recording now. Oh, is it recording? Let's see. I wonder if I can do that. So she's leaning on me for support. All 
right. on the one that's leaving it was a very odd dynamic. Well, it could lead to an open, I mean, wherever you're at, you're at right now, with mm -hmm. the process, uh, who knows, what it can, we can be in it, you know, maybe the mm -hmm. separation mm -hmm. um, might ease things up, and mm -hmm. um, there's mm -hmm. infinite possibilities, yeah. you know, and it's just exploring to what your intentions are, what mm -hmm. your intentions are, mm -hmm. or it could lead in the future, yeah. but, um, yeah, if I can be, I mean, even now, through this whole process, mm -hmm. you know, they're still maintaining... I was talking to a divorce attorney in uh, St. Helens, actually, mm -hmm. um, and a mediator, and we were telling me, Diana, oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. And it was my wife's mediator with her. Right. And there's ways of going to mediation where people can come out on a positive mm -hmm. note, you know. There's some work to understand, are we even compatible, you know, we believe that we're compatible. And that's the first thing I think they could do. And... And true, you know, being really honest and creating these lists, are we you know, acknowledging that we're compatible? And we're not already right there. You go, okay, well, great. So I don't have to judge you. Right. You know, that's a kind of where we got through the hard way, and so now it's more okay. This is happening. Mm -hmm. So let's try to make the best of it and maintain friendly. But while we're in the middle of it, while it's separating this whole little emotion going back and forth, right. I'm I'm more of a that had come up that were kind of uh, triggered something like ahas that you had had? Uh -huh. I'm to something that kind of sort of this, uh, I'll try and articulate this, uh, the guilt and projecting guilt shame, like uh, so you see like the left row Baptist church or something start picketing. Uh, shame on them, you know, they're, they're all like doing something to them. You have the counterparty come and say, well, we need to shame them for shaming them. <laughs> and then in my head, I'm like, look at all these idiots <laughs> hanging out here on the news. And then, yeah, so it, it kind of is a field, different uh, trappings associated with different parties. But yeah, it, it's easy to get caught up without even sure. <laughs> Programs. Yeah. They're all programmed. We see something, that's the animal part of who we are. This is an animal body. You know, the spirit is what operates the body, you know, the mind. Um, but it's an animal body. It's animalistic in nature. You know, so it responds. I mean, that's even going back to the brain. The frontal cortex is 
basically what makes us human, differentiate, differentiate us from animals, humans from animals. The animal brain didn't have the frontal cortex on it. That was just developed through evolution, and it's the thinking, uh, rational, logic, you know, making. Yeah, exactly. Part of the brain. So, since most of the brain is animalistic, you know, it's really easy to. And there's a chart, I didn't put it in here. That uh, below level 200, there's a there's a different process to how we process information. People below 200, um, the way they process information is it comes in through. Um, you know what? I wonder if it's in here. There's uh, there's the thalamus, which is the processing, and then there's the amygdala memory or um, where is that? Anyway, I'm getting my thing going like that. Oh, I don't know. That's in here somewhere. Transcending levels of consciousness. If you uh, look online, I'll send it to you, or you can find it, or you can ask me about something. Yeah. Anyway, how the, here we go, how we process information. <clears throat> I know you can't really see it, but here we have the thalamus is the relay center of the brain. Then we have the cortex, and then we have the amygdala, which is the emotion, and the hippocampus, which is the memory part of the brain. So information comes in, <clears throat> typically through uh, levels of uh, lower than 200. It goes to the, the thalamus. It actually fast tracks past the cortex. So this is why we react versus respond. I had a coach years ago I hired for a while, and he said, Howard, do you know the difference between reacting and responding? Before I could even answer, it was 10 seconds. Yes, sir. <laughs> All right. So the cortex is where we're going to think about things, and where it fast tracks is from the thalamus to the amygdala, um, the emotional part of the brain, and then it gets you know probably stuck in our, in our hippocampus part of the brain. People at above levels 200 now they fast track through the cortex, through the frontal cortex, instead of fast tracking just straight through into the emotion center. It'll get processed, rationalized through the cortex. But as we climb even higher, we, um, I don't want to say develop, but we really reinforce, I guess, is the etheric brain. So this is where we see like, the halo, you know, around um, like the aura. You know, people have an aura to them <clears throat> all around the body, actually. And the more spiritual we become, the more we evolve in consciousness, the more we let go of all these limiting things, the less we have bogging us down, the less dense we are, right? We naturally become lighter and free. Well, because the body is consciousness, there is nowhere that there isn't mind. Of course, Miracle says that darkness cannot hide. We only think that darkness can hide. Right? But in the mind, everything is there in every single cell in our body. So the more we free ourselves and let go of beliefs and concepts which are felt and experienced in the body, um, if we have the belief that money is the root of all evil, or the love of money is the root of all evil, that's, how does that feel in your body? Not good, right? Think of just a negative word. If I say hate, or if I say attack, or shame, that level of intensity, how does your body feel? Versus, you know, I'm so blessed to have you guys show up today. I mean, thank you sincerely and genuinely for showing up today. How did your body feel then? It starts responding a lot differently. So information fast tracks, um, you know, they, they say through the brain, but essentially the mind is everywhere in the body. It's just the relay centers through the brain and the nervous system that uh, we develop the etheric part of the brain, and soon this is where intuition comes up that we don't even have to process anything. We just sense and boom. We know we can discern what's destructive and we can discern what is constructive and helpful and loving, right? Um, all right, so I'm going to play a video short. Yes. That's okay. I've heard, I don't know if it's true or not, but it, men's brains are different. I think it's true that men's brains don't, it 
what do you think with both? We're going to think with both sides of our brains and then think with half. Is that true? I mean, that's the left brain and right brain. So left is the logical side and right brain is the creative side. So we can look at uh, where women are feminine. So the feminine energy is a more creative energy to begin with. But we both have masculine and feminine energies within us, all of us do. Uh, where men were more, you know, very logical, straightforward, hunter and gatherer days. You know, they were very focused and, um, and, and hunting. Everything was just, you know, very... Um, Goal oriented women uh, are yeah. process oriented. Yeah, this we see this problem with problems in the relationships too. Um, men want women to be more logical and stay the same, and women want their men to be more creative and change. <laughs> yeah. You know, so that's not necessarily <laughs> our nature. It is some people their nature. So you have to just find that core within them. Which my relationship program we actually go through some of that as well. So. That's where the that's where it has been. Men are more left brain and women are more right brain. And creative thinking, men are just very you know much more logical and uh, whatnot. So, but we have both, and we have the ability to do both. And we do see men today have shifted, and women have shifted. Yeah. More women out in the workplace, are very goal oriented. Women are the breadwinners today, and, and men you know are more uh, balancing out. Balancing out. Yeah. Absolutely. No, it's just an evolution. It's not a good or bad thing, you know. It's just well, I'm not. I'm just saying that I see the difference between 30 and 35 year olds and I'm pretty and, you know, maybe I listen You spoke earlier today about familiarity. So, would you then... Pause. dedication to truth yeah all right so here so we're talking about fear um, and getting stuck and you know the um, the emotion of anxiety always coming up the nature of withdrawal uh, here's what dr. Hawkins this is a live lecture uh, he did. that's what he's going to explain uh, repeat the instructions for the final door I have to recall how it goes, how it went. Hold on a second. Let me see here. Sorry. Audio. I was playing it earlier. Okay, there we go. This might be loud. I would have, have to recall. recall. Have you remembered everything? There was nothing left. Hold on. Stop this and start it over again. Okay. You spoke earlier today about familiarity. So would oh, you sorry, then, I can't see the video. Uh, repeat the instructions for the final door? I have to recall how it goes, how it went. I would have to recall having surrendered everything. There was nothing left. I was in a very high space, very, uh, how would you say, rarefied, extremely rarefied space in which there was no one and very few beings had passed through this space. That's when you let go of all the ego, see? And 
In this infinite space of almost nothingness, uh, there had been a couple of beings pass through this pass. Hi, it's like a high pass. I saw who had been there. There, they leave a track, a permanent track. You know? I saw Jesus Christ had been there. I saw the agony in the Garden of, of uh, Gethsemane was the letting go of the agony of one's own existence, surrendering it to God. You see, and the, the there was nothing left to surrender. And then came the knowingness, yes, accept your life. Uh, and then I got, this too must be surrendered to thee, O Lord. And I realized that there's the inner belief inside the ego that it is the source of your existence. And I saw that this too had to be surrendered to God. As I surrendered the source of life itself, I surrendered life itself to God. You surrender everything but life itself. And as I surrendered life itself, came forth an agony of dying, severe, a, a true agonized agony. The agony lasted in earthly time. Uh, perhaps a minute or a couple of minutes, uh, but it was severe. And I just kept surrendering to it, and I kept surrendering it to it. And I saw that that which is called I would never again exist because its source of life was now being extinguished and surrendered. So I let go resisting the agony of, of it, the ag part of the agony was a, t a terror, a deep terror, a deep terror, the terror of non-existence. And then came forth the saying from a guru somewhere in the distant past, all fear is illusion, surrender it to God. So I surrendered the fear of non-existence and losing life forever, becoming extinguished, in other words, I surrendered it out of faith to my teacher. That's the value of the energy field of the aura of the teacher. The true teacher is one who has experienced it absolutely through and through and speaks from the authority of having experienced it, not read about it, heard about it, learned about it, but done it. Therefore, the courage came forth as I say, the fear and the terror was uh, severe. And on the other side of the doorway of death, uh, all of life opened up, all of existence opened up and shone forth as the glory of God, which is what shines forth in this room at this moment. What shines forth to me in this moment right now is the glory of God expressing itself as the phenomena that we are now collectively witnessing. Hmm? All right. Thank you. I don't know why the video didn't play. But um, I don't know why the video didn't play. It's been it played when I was posting it out. Um, so with fear then, what he was talking about, all fear being an illusion. Let's see if I can get this back up now. Okay, good. Um, fear being an illusion. we got to have the courage, and we'll go up to courage here, but, you know, with these blocks. And so let's take a look at the next block. So you see, when you're stuck at fear, um, desire would be the next level up. And at fear, we don't even have desire. You know, there's a wanting in this, but there's no strong desire to move out, because the desire is going to pull you out of those lower levels. And you can see, even all the, the ones below it, grief, apathy, right? Apathy, hopelessness. There's no desire in hopelessness. There's a desire, you know, for life to end, but that's where people actively commit suicide is that apathy. 
you know, at grief, finally there's a sense of hopefulness, but even then, you know, it's still so low energetically, and we're so stuck and caught up in resentment that, you know, the only desire that we do have is for that son of a bitch who fired us, you know, to go to hell. <laughs> yeah. So, when he says, all fear is an illusion, it seems real. And in that moment, it is real. And we even look at people with schizophrenia, um, these uh, delusions that they have, delusions of grandeur. They believe that they were a president of the past or uh, that they're a nephew of a president of the past or something, you know, and they believe that that is real. There's a story I remember years ago in Arizona about a guy who shot a police officer when the uh, neighbors called because he was running around with a gun shooting at what he believed to be aliens, uh, aliens that came and abducted the earth. And so the cop came to try to get him to calm down and shot him killed the cop. He thought the cop was an alien and shot him and killed him. You know, so at that level, it seems real. But what we have to do, if we are spiritually devoted, not have to, but the willingness to walk through that, the willingness to, and this is why it's important to attend lectures like these and read the books and have your, have your own mentors. Because when the time comes, and this is what he said, that he remembered in that space that, um, I think it was that video he just said, um, that fear, you know, that said, all power is yours. And from somewhere deep in a past life, you know, there was this voice that came, this more recent voice when he was in the void that said, all power is yours, you can have it. And he said, this thought had come through from who knows where that said, from a, 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 a lesson that he had learned, that some like teaching, our, our power is already, already yours. Our power is already within you, anyway. That you don't need total power to control people, you know. So it was an illusion. And so he had to walk through this, he had to surrender life, thinking what well, he's going to do is surrender life itself. But even that, as we, as we go through different stages, our attachments and our aversions, remember that, key point. All we're surrendering is our attachment and our aversion to things, not to things themselves. So if, when we get to that point in our spiritual evolution where we come to surrender life and that fear comes up, you're not surrendering life as we you know it. You're surrendering, you're surrendering your attachment or your, even your aversion. Someone wants to commit suicide. I mean, can I just let go of my attachment to wanting to commit suicide? Then what happens at that point? You know, is that going to recontextualize it enough for them to start seeing things different? So, then we move up to desire. You know, this part, God is denying. <clears throat> we always want more. We don't have enough. God's denying us. Why can't I get that job? Why don't I ever make enough money? Why are my relationships always failures? Why don't I have, don't I have, don't I have, don't I have? I, my Maserati is in my experience. Mm -hmm. um, that's not a desire. I've let that go, and I've test, <laughs> I've test drove them before. That's just financially, you know, to make that happen. So I know the mods are already here. Uh, view on life disappointing. It's always a craving. No matter how much we have, we always want more. We never ever have enough. Um, enslavement. So then we get trapped by owning these things. You know, there was that. Uh, line in Fight Club, you know, the things that you own end up owning you. And um, when we let go of our attachment, you know, we can still have all the things that we want. And so you're not giving up the dream itself, but uh, what we hold in mind, we know through what we've seen in our experience tends to manifest. Uh, of course, Miracle says that we create what we defend against, even at that level. You know, I don't want, I don't want, how many people say, I don't want to be broke, and what happens? Broke shows up for them, right? Where other people are just gun ho about getting money, and they find it, but they never find enough of it. You know, relationships, the same thing. So it moves you out of fear into something that you at least desire enough, and it's a step forward in the evolutionary process. It's just not somewhere that you want to stay. The downside of desire, so this is also where passion comes from. Passion is here too. You know, passion we see as like, oh, isn't passion good and blah, 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 blah. Again, no good or bad, but passion calibrates around this level of 125, maybe a little bit higher. Um, because it's just, you know, it's what starts wars. 
passion is also what starts wars too, you know? So it's on how are you channeling that energy to work for good or bad? When you're in a high state of consciousness, there is no passion for anything. You're already whole and complete. What do you need passion for? If you're in a state of love, what's passion going to, how's passion going to complement love? Loving unconditionally, right? So you see, you know, where it plays out and where we don't need things at other levels. Um, anger, okay, God's vengeful, life is antagonistic, you know, people are always probing us, our spouses are always probing us, you know, to do certain things and um, push buttons, you know, that's a big thing in relationships, pushing buttons, they really know how to push my button. <laughs> and uh, life, but everybody, even the guy on the road, you know, or the person walking across the crosswalk, did you see how he looked at me? Did you see the look on his face? You know, um, in the process is aggression. This is how it shows up in life. Major, major aggression. So it's an energetic increase. It's not innately good or bad. It's just a leap in consciousness. Um, people show up to these hate parades. What you're talking about? You know, hate parading. And how can we make somebody else be wrong and look wrong and shame them for it and hate them for it? You know, push them on the side. And then you got this group, and then this group's attacking this group, you know, and then this group is looking at them, shaking their heads, going, you know, what the hell is going on? And then you got all these other people like us who are here as spiritual lecture going, God, isn't life great? <laughs> I see all this stuff going on, but hey, I'm here, you know. All I can do is just be happy, and that's the best that I can be. Uh, life's still destructive nature. It weakens the immune system. You actually depress the immune system. For I think uh, like five minutes of anger will depress the immune system for up to like six hours or something like that. So you're just firing off all this cortisol, stress response, you know, all this stuff going on in the body, and anger will actually depress the immune system. So it's just definitely not healthy for you. And then pride. Now again, we move up a little bit. So pride's a little bit big, higher than anger because anger, you know, it's still hate and all these other things. At least pride. You're walking around, you know, I'm better than. <clears throat> My last name is better than your last name. You know, it has more clout. We have more experience. We have our names in these buildings. We did this, you know, for our country or for our people. And you guys didn't do that. I had this title. I have a certain title that I carry with myself. I'm senior vice president. I'm not just a vice president anymore. I'm made senior vice president. All right? I'll tell you. I'll show you how bad, how good I am, Muhammad Ali. Show you how good I am. Right? <clears throat> so pride, um, it's higher, but again, it's still weak because it's selfish. It's I. You know, there's no we. You can have a business, but it's still you. You're the one standing in the spotlight when you win an award, and you're not acknowledging all the people who helped you along the way. So God here is impartial. God can care less. This is the level of uh, like atheism, actually. I think calibrates around 175, 190. <clears throat> People who get into you know these debates about um, you know free will or you know, God is uh, Richard Dawkins. So not David R. Hawkins, but Richard Dawkins. And he wrote the book The God Delusion. <laughs> you know, but what people understand that that's his. Delusion about a delusion. <laughs> you know? So it's all a projection, right? And uh, so you have all these people, and there's integrous atheists, though. There are definitely integrous atheists that calibrate 200. Um, they don't necessarily believe in something else, but they do a lot of good. You know, I think that was me when I was atheist for years and years and years. I mean, for a while I was making people wrong and bad and doing all that stuff, but I got to a point where I stopped. I just didn't care anymore. Know, but I still didn't believe God. But I started doing good things, and um, there's a lot of those people out there. There's a woman I met. She was a marketing expert. We sat down. And the second she said that she was an atheist, and she heard about my spiritual program, the flags came up all of a sudden. I found myself judging her. And as soon as I left and I got in my car, I thought, I don't need to be judging her. You know, she seems to be doing a good job. You know, she's got a great business. Seems to be helping people succeed. How can I judge that just because she's an atheist? How she disciplines her kids, she was talking about her kids and helping them to succeed. I thought, you know, that's good. The only problem that 
she's going to run into, not me, is trying to control every little aspect and thinking that she's in charge of knowing everything that there possibly is to know and trying to wrap her head around that. Well, that ain't going to happen, you know. <clears throat> so we uh, constant struggle for better than or one-upping everyone, sense of entitlement, deserving, separation. Now, there's entitlement. You know, what of Course in Miracles says is we're all entitled to what God created. You know, if we're all God's children, we're all entitled to what he created. His abundance, his love, his peace, his bliss, or its bliss, whatever you want to call it. Deserving, to be deserving of that. You know, we are deserving as a holy child of whoever or whatever. Whatever that source is, to being entitled and deserving of greatness. Being deserving of love. Being deserving of um, happiness, enjoying peace, you know. But we're not just hoarding it for ourselves. That's where it calibrates lower. You know, when we take it and we share it, then everybody gets a piece of the pie. Now we cross over into higher levels of consciousness. Oh, not before that. So here we go. <clears throat> You're not asked to fight against your wish to murder, but you are asked to realize the form it takes conceals the same intent. And it is this, uh, and it is this you fear, not the form. What is not love is murder. What is not loving must be an attack. So being that there is one, this one sonship or brotherhood, uh, one mind, that anything that is unloving to somebody else is an attack on them. And anything that is an attack is to hurt them, and murder them, and kill them. That's where they're coming from and saying that, you know, what is not love is murder. People read this and think, holy shit, that's a pretty bold statement, you know. But... That's where they're coming from, is that we are all one. So every thought that we think, as the Bible says, every hair in your head is counted. <clears throat> every thought that we think, that's what we contribute to the world. That's why these people that are protesting and all this stuff, they don't realize what they're doing. But it's an innocent ignorance, all right? That's what I call it, innocent ignorance. If they knew to do better, they really would. And so with the ego and all these lower states of consciousness, when they come up, we don't fight against them. When the ego comes up, we don't fight against the ego because that's just an attack on our own self. The ego is just an illusion. It's not real. It just appears real. So when we can think of the ego as like a barking dog, and someone comes knocking at your door, and that dog runs up and bark, 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 bark. You know, whenever something comes up in our experience, the ego comes up and says, whoa, 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 wait, wait. Remember what happened last time, or remember what they did before, or remember what you just read about, and all this concern comes up, and it wants to keep you protected. It's got a purpose, you know, it wants to support you to a certain extent. But the ego, <clears throat> the ego believes that it is God, it believes that it's the source of all life. It's a ray of sunshine that believes that it is the sun itself. It's a ripple on a wave that believes it's the whole entire ocean. It has no power. And when we look at it and we face it and we can love it like a pet and say, good little boy, good job for helping me, you know, wanting me to stay protected and all this other stuff. Now you're expressing love to me. Now what happens at this level is spiritual ego <clears throat> comes up. Courage. You know, to stand up for what we believe is right. Or good. Or supportive of life. And spiritual ego will still have spiritual pride. As we grow, I'm more spiritual than you are. You're more spiritual than you might say, well, I'm more, you're more, I'm more spiritual than you. I'm the one going to all these classes, and I, you know, I, I, I practice martial arts, and I meditate for two hours a day, and you only meditate for one hour a day. You know, <laughs> all these things. And uh, I've experienced unconditional love more frequently in my life than you have, and, you know, oh, spiritual ego comes up. So what? Big deal. Great. Hey, take it. Run with it. Just be mindful of not making somebody else wrong. You can think about it all you want in your own mind, fine. But no, it's, that's going to be a block within itself too. So what we do is eventually we trick the ego, the small self, the self with the lowercase s, when we get close enough in our, our process of evolution, spiritual evolution, that it gets so close to the self with the capital S where there are no blocks and the sun is radiating that it naturally dissolves on its own and it tricked its own self into becoming enlightened. Not, not a bad thing, right? Just be mindful about how you feel as you're 
making other people wrong, even in your own mind. So Gandhi's followers, you know, different parts of the country, the uh, United States celebrates in the four 20s. Uh, 500 is the state of love um, on, that, on that map. 500 is the state of love, 400. We'll go through these two real quick. But um, India at that time, you know, the, the collective consciousness of mankind there was very low, below 200. You know, they're fairly struggling to get by. They're poor, a lot of poverty. And... Um, and uh, so here comes Gandhi, you know, he was an attorney, but he's Indian, first class ticket on a train. Security guy comes by and says, you have brown skin, you need to go to the back. Well, I bought a ticket, first class ticket, I paid for this. And I'm an attorney, so now he's got status too. Well, what had more power? The color of your skin. Security guy said, well, you're going in the back, if you don't, we're kicking you off the train. He refused to kick him off the train. <clears throat> now, he got authentically angry. He used anger in a constructive way versus a destructive way. He created a resistance movement, you know, and a key to enlightenment. One of the keys to enlightenment is non-resistance. But he didn't, uh, he said when he was a child that his pastor would read both from the Quran and the Bible. So, so he learned both growing up. And he said, you know, if they strike us, Christ said, turn the other, our enemy strikes us, Christ said, turn the other cheek. That's what he would tell his people. But isn't that being passive? No, not being passive at all. We're here not to strike back. If we start fighting against them, then we're feeding into what they want us to. And we will not display that. So the people, you know, innocently ignorant, a lot of people did fight back. <clears throat> a lot of them were shot. But where this lifetime, and the next lifetime, fighting back, finally for what they believed in, they, um, they broke that barrier. You know, where their consciousness was so low before, the lower levels of consciousness. Now they found, Gandhi came and enlightened them. Gandhi calibrated in the 700s. These people were low hundreds, probably. At the time of Christ, <clears throat> at the time of Buddha, the, the collective consciousness of mankind was about 90. By the time Christ was around, it was about 100. This is the average mind collectively around, around the world. All right? So now, up until 1980s, mankind collectively was at 190. British Empire was at 190 when Gandhi, at 700, came around. One man collapsed the British Empire. You know, not one man, but his consciousness. Because it was the people who also helped against that, too. His, his consciousness was so high and so pure and so loving that when his people would start fighting after he told them not to, he would start fasting. Word would get around, Gandhi is fasting, he's sick, he's going to die. Stop fighting back. People would stop. And it went back and forth until he finally died. And now, look what happened. You know, so that's how strong, this is, remember the logarithmic scale? <clears throat> 700 is not just growing 700 times. It's 700 to the 700, you know, or whatever it is, power. So these people now crossing over that are going to be born to that next life of they used to at a higher level than 200. You know. um, kamikazes, the courage that they had to face, um, they actually calibrated that 540, an unconditional love for their country. <clears throat> we were fighting. They were fighting for their country. We were fighting for our country. Who's right? Who's not? You know, they were doing what they had to do. Neutrality, um, this is kind of a level of, you know, I don't know. I'm neutral. In a situation, eh, I'm neutral. I don't care either way. I'm, I trust this level of uh, trust, emotion. I trust that everything will work out fine. I have an opinion, but I'm not really sure on it. You know? So we have God is finally enabling. If you don't like satisfactory, we start releasing the things that we think that we know. Willingness, 310, a view on God, God is inspiring, we become hopeful, optimistic, intention. Um, one's ability to go forth, finally, in truth. Uh, the onset of trustingness itself, so the journey of a thousand miles, we have to be willing to take that first step. Right? So a little bit different than neutrality, a little bit different than courage. Courage still seems kind of aggressive, 
right? We have to face fear. Now we finally have the willingness to even see fear differently than what we thought it to be. Uh, level of acceptance, God is merciful, harmonious, uh, our process of forgiveness. And this is where we really start taking leaps in consciousness, is when we can get to this place and start forgiving everything. Forgiving ourselves, forgiving a projection that we see, even if it's loving, and it looks beautiful, saying, God, I surrender even this loving uh, thing that I'm looking at. You know, I surrender my attachment to that lovingness to you. And this is where we start growing leaps and bounds. One's ability to understand the best that they can, even if they don't quite grasp the whole picture yet. You know, we don't know how electricity really works. We just trust that we turn on a light switch and it's going to go on. You know, we turn our key in the ignition. We just have an acceptance that it's going to turn on <laughs> when I turn the key. You know, we don't really understand how it works, but we trust. Um, I'm going to blaze through these last few slides. Um, reason, this is the level of the intellect. Um, this is where we really start doing research on things. Um, presidents of the United States are in the four, high 400s. You know, people who go for their doctorate degrees, just a lot of research is here. But again, it's still reason. So now we're still in the field of linear objectivity. All right. Still trying to make sense, but life becomes meaningful as well you know everything around us we can give more meaning to which makes life go along a little bit easier why did this happen and we start looking for more meaning about why that happened understanding uh, life is abstract the process is abstraction so Einstein Bacon Francis Bacon Freud Newton they were all at 499 they went to the level of objectivity as high as you can go as the intellect itself will take you these are the greatest minds of the world calibrated at 499, a lot of them in the high 400s. Presidents of the United States are in about like the 440, 450 range or something like that. Okay. <clears throat> then we get into love. Now we've crossed over into subjectivity, experiential side of life. God is loving. Life is benign. Uh, we have more reverence, right? And revelation, the process of revelation, we just start intuitively picking up on wisdom and knowledge, you know, to move forward versus having to process every little thing out. Unconditional love is the level of 540, joy. God is one, complete serenity, transfiguration. Um, I think this was the level of a lot of, yeah, saints. Spiritually based self-help groups, AA calibrates at 540. So when someone's stuck, just even being in the presence of an unconditional loving group, they're automatically lifted. Someone can commit murder, walk into an AA group the next day and say, I was drunk, I killed my spouse or my child or whatever. And with the rules of, you know, of AA, we'll sit down, talk about it, cry. We hold a space of love for you. Let's figure out what we got to do next. You know, are you going to run? Are you going to go to the cops? You know, that's unconditional love. This is what AA groups do. You can come in. You can meet any 12-step program. If it's not addiction to alcohol, if it's narcotics, if it's sex, if it's food, if it's anything, you can show up to a 12-step program, and they're going to welcome you with open arms, allowing you to share anything that you want without being judged about it. Because every single one of us, we all have our own dark secrets that we like to get off our chest. They hold that space for us to express that, you know. There are a lot of groups today that aren't so loving. You just have to find the right ones. I've heard uh, a lot of friends in AA program, they call them AA Nazis. Uh, it's more fear-based. They, If you leave the group after being there for so long, you can't leave. I just have my brother. You're going to relapse and blah, blah, blah. You know, this is our sponsors. So it's kind of like uh, you got to be mindful of that and if the, the sponsor does come off that way you just have to acknowledge you know they're expressing themselves the best that they can and trust your own guidance in moving forward um this makes unconditional love constant accompaniment to all uh, so here joy expresses itself constantly through every experience it's not showing up to a place that brings me love anymore it's not this person i love being around i just feel so peaceful when i'm around them 
those are the lower than 500s, the objective cause and effect. Here there is no cause and effect. So joy is just a natural expression of, of your higher self radiating from within because now the clouds are starting to dissipate even more. So joy is more of an effect that just shows up everywhere you go. Um, the persistence of a positive attitude in the face of prolonged adversity. And we see this with a lot of Viktor Frankl, someone who was in the Holocaust, who found meaning, you know, in this situation. 600, view on God, all being. Life is perfect. You constantly experience bliss. And the process is illumination. You just see in everything the radiance of God in a glass of water, you know, in a shiny car driving down the street, you know, clouds in the sky, a dead tree, you know, that burned down years ago, but it's still there. You know, you see the illumination in everything. People say, let's tear down the tree. You say, no, leave it up. It's just a beautiful expression of what it is and what it's gone through. Nothing wrong with the tree being there. You know, you see weeds. You see the illumination and weeds growing in your garden. You know, um, Saint John of the Cross was someone who calibrated in 600, 605. Ramakrishna, Kar uh, he was at 620. Karmapa, 630. Swami Satchitananda, 605. Lao Tzu, uh, the author of Tao Te Ching, 610. <clears throat> Enlightenment, 700 to 1,000. So 600 is the technical level of enlightenment. Um, 700 to 1,000 is, you know, that's where the true enlightenment uh, or your view on God is the self with the capital S. You realize that you are, you are that. You know, you are one with God. The view on life is that it is. The emotion is ineffable. And the process is pure consciousness, ineffable. You can't talk about your experiences without taking away from what it actually was. This is the subjective experiential side. How did you feel when you came out of that meditation? It's hard to even put a word. I can't even barely describe it. If I was to describe it, it's not really what it is. You know? um, Ramesh Balsakar, he was at 760. Meister Eckhart, 705. Nisargadatta Maharaj, 720. Ramana Maharshi, I've read a lot of his stuff, 720. Pantajali, 715. Plotinus, 730. Mother Teresa, 710. Saint Teresa of Avila, 715. And Huang Po, the aphorisms of Huang Po. Um, this is a wonderful story. Uh, 960, he covered it. 960. So, a quick um, thing, forgiveness. So here's some tools, and then we'll get into your meditations. Is everybody okay on time? Yeah. Uh, so what forgiveness is not forgiveness is not letting someone off the hook we think if I forgive somebody on I letting them off the hook no you're not letting them off the hook they say forgiveness is for you it comes through you first before the other person right it's not just acceptance itself it's not just being accepting of what's going on we used to always, how do I forgive these uh, ISIS this group ISIS for everything that they're doing or would it be a family that was in one of the towers during 9-11, you know? How do I forgive those people for killing my husband or my kids or whoever was in that in that building? I'm just supposed to be accepting of it? No, nope, that's not what it is. It's not having to apologize to someone. So if we have been physically abused or emotionally abused as children, forgiveness isn't calling up the person on the phone and saying, hey, you know what? I found peace in my heart, you know, for you. And I just want to say, I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> you know? No, that's not saying that at all. And it's not just for the other person. Forgiveness is a miracle itself. Of course, a miracle says a miracle is a shift in perception from darkness to light. Forgiveness is asking, how do I see this differently? You ask the question, God, help me to see this situation differently. I'm looking at this person, I'm looking at an event, and I'm having a hard time letting it go. I'm judging it. I'm angry. I'm pissed off. I feel taken advantage of. Grief, right? But I'm learning that you did not create those things. I'm learning that you only created love, joy, happiness, peace. And I don't feel peace. So I ask you to help me see this differently. There is your shift in perception. So forgiveness is a miracle in itself. You might be watching TV, you might pick up a book and you say, you know, well, what happened to, you know, the child molester? What happened in their life growing up as a kid? 
that they had to take advantage of an innocent child. Something happened in their programming, something happened in their consciousness that they switched off. They switched somewhere and they felt the need to take advantage of the innocence in, in a child, you know. And we started thinking about that and we think, God, you know, psychopaths. The psychopath does not have a conscience. No conscience. Straight animal instinct. So if they hear a voice, they're going to believe that voice. If it says kill so-and-so and -so, God, they're going to go kill so-and-so and then God. How do you judge somebody with no conscience? Sure, it looks tragic, but that's them showing up our own experience that I have a belief that tragic exists. God, help me believe that tragic does not exist. Because I see a lot of it in the world, but I'm learning you didn't create that. What is this then? Start questioning the illusion. You don't question God or your source, whatever that is. All right? Start learning to question the illusion. When when broke is showing up, don't question, God, I've been praying for money. Why is it not showing up? You don't question God. You question the illusion. This is an illusion. Abundance is my nature. I need, I turn from peace and I went the other way. All right, so forgiveness is for the one self. So as we forgive, we set the whole sonship free. There is that lesson too that what we give reinforces that givingness, tithing. You know, they say with money, tithing. Um, whatever it is that you give, that becomes reinforced. When we give information, lessons, what I share with you today, as you believe it and you integrate it within your own experience of life and you beginning to share that, you see how it naturally starts compounding, it starts growing, it starts reinforcing, right? Tithing works the same way. Whatever form, if it's um, financial tithing, if it's books. I've had people who are always donating books, and more books tend, kept showing up in their life. And they were thinking, where the hell are books showing up? I don't want more books, you know? And um, they were doing what they could with what they had. And it was actually about one of my mentors, and that's what she said. She was a finally come my attention that if we want more money, you know, to practice giving money. She goes, you don't have to take 10%. She goes, if it's a quarter, you know, if it's a roll of quarters. If it's a buck, it doesn't matter how much it is. Whatever you feel peaceful about giving. Say that you just got 2,000 bucks and 10% would be 200. You're like, ah, oh, I got bills I can't really afford. In my mind right now, afford 10%, you know, but I can, I can, I feel peaceful about 10 bucks. You know, so you donate that 10 bucks and then... You watch how more of it shows up in your experience. It's not that you're giving to get, but what you're reinforcing is that the nature of of um, of giving, giving itself. And that's what we do when we forgive. When we forgive, we let other people off the hook. We let the whole sonship off the hook. If I could pray for you guys to forgive me for anything. You do that forgiving, you free yourself, you forgive. You free me, you free lots of other people. It's a shift of perception. It's a letting go of judgment. It's being willing to see the truth of the matter. Like I said earlier, God, help me to see the truth in this. What I'm looking at, I know, is less than the truth. It's an illusion. But man, I seem to be really glued to this illusion. But I'm willing not to hold on to it. It's what A Course in Miracles says that your only job is to not be willing to hold on to the belief. And that that divine consciousness, that divine wisdom, does the work on God's behalf for you. But God can't take something that you're not willing to give up. And God will not intervene without your willingness because that would be an attack on your mind. That's why we can't will, impose our will upon other people to change. Because that's an attack on them. So we just have to be the best that we can be and lead by example. So EFT, also known as tapping, um, what you do is if you want to forgive and you have a hard time forgiving, if you guys real quick want to think of something that you've been having a hard time letting go, if there's like a financial situation, if there's somebody that did something to you, if there's a worry even, anticipating something in the future, I don't know if this thing is going to work out, uh, job position, whatever it is, anything that kind of brings up a little bit of stuff. What you do is you gauge that on a scale of 0 to 10. You ask yourself, so scale of 0 to 10, like how heavy, how strong is this feeling right now, 10 being really intense? All right, so put that on the scale. And then we have different meridian points. So we have the top of the head here, 
we have um, in between the eyes. So you can use two fingers to tap there. There's the side of the eye. Yeah, so if you use your two fingers, you're not spreading them wide, but right on the inside of the top of the bridge, you know. There's the side of the eye. Um, right on that, right where you feel the, the socket, the bone socket there. And then there's under the eye. Okay, so right on the fleshy, cheeky part, right underneath the bone. There's under the nose. Um, there's the chin point, which is just that crease between your lip and your chin. There's a collarbone. Uh, if you feel where your collarbone is at, where it kind of does this and goes down, it's um, right in that corner, right about in that corner. And you can do left or right. It's just right on the inside. Then there's over the heart. Um, there's under the breast for men. You can tap here. For women, you can tap off over to the side, right along um, where the bottom of the breast would be, off to the side. And then there's the karate chop point here. Um, right below the pinky bone on the side of the hand, that fleshy part, right underneath the pinky, and you just barely tap right there. So what you do is you just hold in mind what it is that's bothering you. Just think, you know, this pain, if there's physical pain in the body. I did this with my mom when she had degenerative disc. She could barely turn her head, like barely turn her head this way or that way. And I said, all right, let's tap. Let's tap. So just think about the pain, and in your mind, just think this pain, this pain, this pain. This is how I would tap. And we went through all the different ones, and we did it about 10 times. We went through about 10 rounds. And finally, she was able to turn her head about from there to there, when she can barely even move it like this or that. So it's just the acupuncture system in the body, and what it does is energy gets trapped when we have limited beliefs and fears. And tapping on these points helps free it up. So if you want to do one round real quick, think about that thought or the belief or situation. Gauge it on a scale of 0 to 10, your own mind. And then in your mind, just you can repeat whatever that is. If it's pain, if it's uh, you know spouse, if it's job, if it's money. So that might repeat it in your own mind. This money, this money, this money, or this job, this job, this job. This person, okay. So uh, you guys want to do a round real quick? Yeah. All right. So we'll start at the top of the head, right in the center of the head. You can use two fingers. You can use more fingers if you want. Doesn't matter. And just repeat. This thing, this thing, you tap your brow like nine, ten times or so. And then move to the eyebrow point. Keep repeating that thing in your mind. Holding in mind what's painful. That's in the eye. And then move to the side of the eye, either side, doesn't matter. Keep repeating to yourself whatever this problem is. Tap under the eye. Right on the, right next to the nose. There you go. And then we can move to under the nose. Keep repeating the thing to yourself. Under the chin. Repeat. Go to the collarbone. There you go. And then you can move to over the heart. Start tapping over the heart. Left or right, doesn't matter. Keep repeating that painful thing to in your mind. And then um, we'll just go to the karate chop point. Go to the karate chop point. Right under the pinky. Just right underneath that bone. Tap. All right. And take, uh, you can go ahead and stop. Take a few breaths. Do you feel it's decreased a little bit? Still the same? Still the same? Yeah. Got down a little bit? Nine to six? Yeah, if you're going to put it on another number, <clears throat> choose that number. And you do it over and over again until it brings it down to a level where you finally feel it's gone or close enough to gone that you can move forward in a situation. Even if it was having to have a conversation with somebody and you're nervous about that conversation. You just start tapping. And the karate chop point is always a good one, too, if you're out somewhere in public and you don't really want to tap all over your head. You, know? you can just tap on the karate chop point. <clears throat> um, the heart's another good one, too, you know, if you're just doing this, people don't really pay attention. I actually saw years and years ago when I first learned this, I saw a woman get on the freeway, on the on-ramp. I was already on the freeway. And I started driving and I started tapping. I was like, oh, my God, someone's tapping in the car. How cool. <laughs> yeah. um,
Okay, prayer. Here's another tool. ASC, my Robin Duncan type teacher, she taught this acronym, ASK. And it's a cool little reminder. So if we don't know how to pray, or we don't feel like we pray very well, it's a cool little thing. So ASK, A-S-C. So what we do is we acknowledge the problem. Dear God, I acknowledge I'm experiencing lack. I'm looking at my wallet, and I only see a few dollars. I don't know where my next dollar is going to come from. Um, but I do acknowledge that it is just an illusion that you did not create lack. So I surrender any thoughts, any negative beliefs, um, anything unserving that I'm holding on to. I turn over to you and I surrender to your love, to your guidance, to your blessings, to your miracles. And then C is choose peace as your goal. So choose again, choose again, choose instead of looking at lack, I choose peace instead of this. God, I choose peace instead of this illusion. I hold a space in my mind. You can imagine a void being in your mind. And uh, I choose peace so that this divine guidance will come in and do the work for me. And that's it. I acknowledge the problem. I acknowledge there's lack. I turn over any doubts, worries, concerns, fear over to you. I surrender to your power. You can even say, I borrow your certainty. If I don't feel certain, I trust in your certainty. You know, I'm not experiencing it. I surrender to that. And I choose peace as your goal for my happiness instead. Thy will be done. Amen. You cannot be asked to accept answers which are beyond the level of need that you can recognize. Therefore, it is not the form of the question that matters, nor how it is asked. Does that kind of help too? Knowing it, just to turn something over, just to acknowledge that I'm experiencing a problem, but I know it's not true. And I don't even know the right words to use, but this is all the best that I can do. And I'm just asking for peace instead. So it doesn't matter nor the form of the question or how it's asked. The form of the answer, if and if it is given by God, will suit your need as you see it. So this is why no agenda. Don't expect something to turn up a certain way. <clears throat> because you might block the actual bigger miracle from happening. This might be good enough for what God's got in store for you. It's Fucking fantastic. Yeah. Man, fucking fantastic. Uh, that was part of Song of Prayer. Good thing there's no children on the broadcast. <laughs> <clears throat> and then five steps to letting go. Okay? So the first step, and I can send these to you guys if you want them. Don't label the problem. So a problem comes up, don't put a label on it. You know, I have a, I broke half of my tooth when I first moved up here a few months ago. And, um, I put that tooth pack inside of it and it wears down and the nerve is exposed and starts, you know. So I learned not to even call it pain because even pain is a program. You know, toothache, headache, back pain, broke, financial loss, divorce, whatever it is that you're experiencing, don't label it because by giving it a label, you've just given it power. You've assigned a whole program to what that thing is. Remember lesson two, what I see from the street has all the meaning that I've already given it. Right? So you don't label the problem at all. Number two, identify the qualities of the problem. You know, it just feels heavy, feels burdening, feels hot, feels cold. Um, whatever qualities come up about the problem, and then your attractions and aversions to them too. You can identify what is what, it's a, what attraction do I have to this and I surrender that attraction got it when I get angry I'm not going to call it anger I'm just going to call it, there's a a lot of uh, energy I have lots of energy <laughs> in this moment you know but it feels destructive I have some destructive energy um, and I'm attracted to the payoff I feel so high and mighty to it you know I feel strong and I feel powerful and I feel like if I just told this person what I wanted to say that was on my mind that I can get them to change you know, identify the quality of the problem. Three, practically accused of enlightenment. Non-attachment, non-resistance, non-judgment. Don't resist the energy. Allow it just to come up. Allow it to exhaust because it's forceful. Remember the lower levels of consciousness. It's forceful. It will exhaust itself. It cannot last forever so long that you're not focusing on the problem. This is why we don't even label it. And then non-attachment, non-resistance, non-judgment. So just don't judge yourself. Don't judge the situation. 
identify the limiting belief. So even so, where that uh, attraction or the aversion to it, what belief do I have that this keeps coming up in my? Well, I believe you can look at your belief if you're anger, you know, that people can be attacking, that people can be mean, that people can be brutal, that people can be hurtful. Um, that God, even, you know, what is it that you're blaming God for? You know, you go into all those things, these beliefs, and then you surrender everything. And if you don't know what the belief is, you can ask in prayer or meditation and say, God, show me what this belief is so that I can turn it over. Already God knows that you have a problem. You've already turn to him or it to say, hey, I'm not feeling comfortable. I want your peace instead. So remember, the form of the prayer is not important. Now, I just choose not to hold on to it. I surrender. You're in a bank. Some guys come in with AK-47s and they hold up the bank. The difference between letting go and surrendering or giving up and surrendering. Giving up says, I'm screwed. You guys have power over me. There's nothing I can do. We're not asking you to give up. We're asking to surrender. What does surrender mean? Right now, in this moment, there's not much that I can do. But I'm not giving up because I can pray for a miracle. You know, maybe if these guys, uh, when they're not paying attention, you know, there might be an opportunity for me or some people to do something, whatever it is. But there's always prayer, so you're not giving up. Giving up is even giving up on prayer, giving up on God. Surrendering is surrendering to the power of God. You're not surrendering to the illusion. Surrender to the power of God. God, we're in a sticky situation, and it looks like a lot of us can get hurt. I know that you didn't create any of this. Actually, here's another story of uh, Robin. She was somewhere. I don't know where she said it. was a quick story. She said someone came up, held her at gunpoint, and immediately she went into prayer. She prayed out loud the Lord's Prayer, and the guy unloaded his weapon, dropped it, and took off right then and there. She's so quick to not acknowledge the illusion. That death is possible. That would be the belief. Right? And the guy unloaded, dropped the gun, took off. Uh, so your own volition is what makes deciding difficult. We think letting go is so hard. Letting go is not hard. It's your own volition that makes deciding a difficult task. So once you accept his plan as the one function that you would fulfill, there will be nothing else, the Holy Spirit or divine guidance, will not arrange for you without your effort. How does that sound? Without your effort. He will go before you, making straight your path and leaving in your way no stones to trip on and no obstacles to bar your way. Nothing you need will be denied to you. Not one seeming difficulty, but will melt away before you reach it. You need take thought for nothing, careless of everything, except the only purpose, keywords, that you would fulfill. As that was given you, so will its fulfillment be. God's guarantee will hold against all obstacles, for it rests on certainty and not on contingency. So when we let go, of course, remember it says that a healed mind does not plan. A healed mind does not plan. People think that's irresponsible. Robin came from an accounting background, so she was very process-oriented. You know, everything on time, everything organized, all this stuff. When she read that, it, was, it took a little while. Now it doesn't plan for nothing. Hold in mind, whatever challenge or illusion is showing up, hey, I turn over because all I ask for is your peace. And his peace includes everybody, including yourself. What more could you ask for? No stones to trip on? No obstacles in your way? If you cannot impose your plan upon that divine intelligence plan, right? And it's not a plan in a way that we think about plan for Earth, that God would plan people to be over there killing and all that kind of stuff for some to get cancer. It's not what we're talking about. It's not what the Court of Miracles is talking about. It's talking about that plan for peace. And if we just let go of control, we just trust that we're the same, you know, that first nine months that we're being born, that that same intelligence still exists. But the ego came and said, no, nope, thanks God, but we got this ego. They say edging God out, right? Acronym. Okay. <clears throat> and trust. So just trust. Is built during trying times, not always the good times. And don't trust in yourself, but trust in God within you to handle everything on your behalf. Um, we just skip through these. <clears throat> um, let's see how long is that? What time do we got? We'll bring Carl's up here to do his 
presentation. All right, are you ready? Sure. All right, so I'm at Carl's. I don't know how long we've been friends on Facebook, and you go ahead and come up. Um, through a Dr. Hawkins group, is that? I'm pretty sure, yeah. How yeah. we came to know each other, and he heard when I was driving up here, he goes, hey, if you're, you know, around, I'm right across the river and have some coffee. So I went to, uh, I, when I introduced uh, Course in Miracles to Sandy, and I went over to Washington, Victoria, to get a book at Barnes & Noble. Called him up and we sat down and had a great conversation. Very, very blessed, sincerely, to have met you. And that's a two-way street. Thank you. Cross paths. Yeah. So I reached out to him to do a meditation, and he's going to do his own meditation for us. So it's all yours. Uh, for Howard, yeah. Um, I think I'm going to – I was going to ask about those cushions to see if they were at our disposal. Sure. Uh, if, I'll give that option to you guys if you want to be a little more formal with it or if you're comfortable sitting in the chair. But if you want to grab a cushion. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I've ever done something like that. It's great. We can move the chairs. Um, well, uh, since we got the cushions out, maybe we'll face the wall. Okay. Traditional doesn't match. Uh, and those, I don't know if anybody's still on the broadcast. Check it out real quick. This is one of those things. If you're uh, uncomfortable for any reason and you prefer a chair, maybe uh, I think so. Uh, Cross-legged or like uh, uh, karate style. <laughs> the karate is the uh, 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 So joining us on broadcast, I'm going to point the camera toward Carl's and uh, if you'd like to join us, <clears throat> just follow his instructions. Oh. Here's some uh, formal trappings. Uh, meditation, of course, is something you can take with you anywhere. Um, I would like to be in a space one day where I just am continually meditating. Uh, still working on that. So, let me get comfortable here. Sometimes we do this with shoes off, but uh, of course, hard going keeping my shoes on. Um, and uh, I'm going to go through some of the tools that I learned in practicing Zen meditation at a couple of different Zen Buddhist centers. Um, I did not pick up meditation uh, directly through that. I picked it up here and they provided some, some good tools. Uh, so there's a preamble at a temple I went to in Seattle that I thought would be a good opening for this, and then we'll uh, do some of the posture and breathing. And uh, it goes like this. And generally, the whole crowd would say it, you know, but uh, you know, I mean, we want to, they know it, so if you know it, great, if you don't, then. Uh, okay, we repeat it, because you can have to repeat afterwards. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll do it line by line. Okay. okay. Uh, sentient beings are numberless. Sentient beings are numberless. We vow to save them all. We vow to save them all. Delusions are endless. Delusions are endless. We vow to cut through them all. We vow to cut through them all. The teachings are infinite. The teachings are infinite. We vow to learn them all. We vow to learn them all. The Buddha way is inconceivable. The Buddha way is inconceivable. We vow to attain. We vow to attain. And I'm going to spare you guys uh, all the prostrations, and I don't know if I can even remember them correctly. So maybe we'll just start off with a simple bow. Uh, and uh, so we'll get into it. Uh, if you can and you're comfortable, sit with your spine. Straight up and down. Of course, there's a curve to your spine, so don't worry about straightening your spine out like a ruler, but 
you know, so you relax. And you do not have to uh, have your eyes open or closed, but relax is uh, the way to start. So find maybe uh, something on the wall or somewhere where you can just kind of relax your gaze on. It doesn't matter what. And typically, uh, you would have our hands with your left hand over your right, palms up. Um, if you're uncomfortable, you can rest them on your knees uh, either way. And we'll start off with some breathing. So what, what you want to do when you inhale is your inhale is going to be slightly shorter than your exhale. Your exhale is a little more drawn out, but you want it to feel natural, and you're going to feel impulses to scratch and shift, and if you need to do those things, this isn't a pain on your back meditation. Uh, so there's going to be some shifting involved. And you want to focus the, your energy or where you're focused at in your body is about three finger widths below your belly button. That's kind of the seat of where all your energy is. Um, in this uh, particular lineage. So, I'm inhaling. If you can't breathe through your nose, breathe through your mouth. Uh, thoughts will arise. Feelings will arise. And you're not trying to get rid of them. You're not trying to distinguish them. You want to be aware of them and you let them come and you let them go. So uh, if you're having a horrible time in life and uh, your financial ruin and your relationships are a disaster, this is a perfect exercise. Everything's going well for you in life. And uh, you've got your dream car and uh, the perfect spouse. This is the perfect thing for you. So uh, I guess we'll get started here. For about 20 minutes, one minute's Sure. Or uh, two, ten, ten, okay. Absolutely. Yeah. And for your Yes, yes. Yeah. We don't want to burn anybody out here. Um, I have a ten thing on my phone timer. Should we sit down? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Clear instructions.
imitate each other and everything like that. Mm -hmm. I don't have a point of reference for the computer to be able to for today. Yeah. <laughs> First time I went to a legit sendo, uh, I uh, I had my cell phone and I gave us kind of like a, a talk. Uh, turn off your cell phones before we go in and meditate. And uh, I said, well, I'll put mine on mute, vibrator mute, and that should suffice. And as uh, we're sitting there, you know, I got shaved head guy here, shaved head guy here, and, um, you know, sparks of light and everything with my delusional brain. Uh, my phone goes off when we're in this silent space, and so, I had my alarm set, and went off, and then shattered the tranquility. Um, I'm pretty sure it was rap music. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the next visit I went, um, okay, I'll have my phone off, I'll power off this time, and uh, again, we're tranquil and silent, a little bit of indigestion. You can hear other people's indigestion from across the room. <laughs> you become really in tune with your environment. And uh, miraculously, my phone went off again. Um, even though I powered off when you set an alarm, uh, it powers the phone back on. The little clock is still alive. So, there's my quasi-Zen Buddhist uh, parable. Um, so, I'll give you a, a lineage parable, if I can recall one. Um, well, here's a question first, and I'm going to give this to you because this was given to me by my former Zen teacher, uh, and he gave me another um, koan to ponder, and I'm not supposed to give that one away, uh, because that's something for me to ponder, and I'll go back if I've figured it out. It's been a couple of years, so I haven't figured it out yet. Mm -hmm. um, but the question he asked me was, where were you before your mother was born? I never figured that one out. Maybe you guys can figure that one out. You want to expand on what a koan is? A koan, uh, or a kongon in the north, is a lineage from Korea. Uh, koan is a uh, koan. I think that's the Japanese word for the same thing. It's basically a parabolic, parable question that challenges your conceptual thinking. So it's something is the one what is the sound of one hand clapping? Those the questions don't make sense because it's trying to challenge you to be aware without thinking. So that's the abstract and subjective, nonlinear question. I'm not going to answer it in the linear, typical way that we would answer the question. Right. And I think it's, yeah, it could be a tool to put you in touch with this direct experience, which we're a part of in our waking moment throughout our day, but sometimes we are 
unaware that we are still aware. Um, so that's a good contemplation and a, a form of meditation. Meditation kind of takes you away from the world where we have to sit uh, and just let thoughts, you know, be and we separate from them and get into that space of peace, of stillness, contemplation. And this, uh, you can let me know if this is a good thing for, for the colon. Uh, contemplation is to hold a thought in mind. Not trying to answer it, but just seeing how it reflects in your experience. And so maybe with this question throughout the day, even asking for guidance, you know, like God, this question came into my awareness, um, you know, help me to find its answer. And, and again, with no agenda, being open to what shows up for you as you contemplate that throughout the day. Does that sound? Does that sound? I think that's a, a, a wonderful, way, wonderful way of putting it. It's the, the question is, uh, cliche as it may sound is more important than the answer sometimes and getting in that space of asking kind of makes you aware of what's being aware of the question being asked and that's closer to the answer you need rather than getting a linear concrete here's here's the answer to that question let's move on to the next question yeah yeah what is aware of being aware Maybe that'll be my next question. Mm -hmm. All right, we gotta wrap up. Okay. Are we good? Absolutely. Yeah? Yeah. Anything else you want to finish up? Um, definitely uh, I'd like to just expound on, on the forgiveness thing. Uh, being kind to yourself is, is like paramount to a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Both small self and, and big self. Um, we all grapple with that. I grapple with that. Thank you, Howard, for, for this opportunity. Wonderful, wonderful presentation. Yeah. Uh, you know, kind of hit the nail uh, on the head in a lot of areas. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. We'll give Carl a round of applause. So we just got um, some resources to share with you guys. We have some raffle items to give away real quick too. Um, seems everyone's still online. Who's online? Um, and then uh, anybody who wants to stay for questions and answers, you guys can stay for questions and answers. Everybody's got to go. I want to mark your time because I know we're already a little over. Um, five minutes past two. So. Um, the Q and A. So I want to see if this video will play real quick because this is if you don't, it's so important to find a mentor. Really, really important to find a mentor. Uh, I have spent so many years doing things myself because I was the one going to all the classes, and I thought I knew everything, you know. <laughs> and I was trying Sorry. to fix myself, which I got through a lot of stuff. Yes, yeah, put you guys in the snacks. You know, bring them over. Snack them. Um, finally, I got to a point where I, I call it humility or whatever, that I recognized I needed someone else to see the things that I couldn't see for myself. You know, it started, it started when I was reading Carl Jung's book, Psychology of the Unconscious. And uh, he says, what is unconscious is always unconscious, meaning until it becomes subconscious, it's always going to become, it's always going to stay unconscious. We have the unconscious mind which we have no, we just completely unaware. We have subconscious, which consciously we don't figure out, but we get glimpses of it in dreams or through our behaviors that others will recognize and point things out. And then we have the conscious mind, which is the thinking, you know, it sees, we understand kind of level. Uh, so before I moved up here, I had a therapist for a while, I hired a therapist, 
And many reasons for that too. You know, I think therapy just has a bad thing. People think that they're screwed up if they have to go see a therapist. And therapy is such a wonderful thing. It's not everything. Traditional psychotherapy is not everything. Uh, you have triangle, you have spirit, mind, and body. We all need to work on all three levels to, uh, to get the most out of healing. Because uh, the body is just the body. The body is mutual. The body is only at the effect of the mind. And mind's going to be at the effect of spirit and a linear, and a linear, and a lineage. All right. So when we do, you know, say that someone went to a 12-step program, they got some spiritual work, they do some spiritual work, but they're also seeing a therapist where they can talk about things in the, you know, uh, um, educated professional. There you go. That's what I was looking for. Professional can get them to whatever form of therapy that they're they're in. And then the exercising, the eating healthy, the clean drinking, the eating whatever foods that are heavy on the body, working on all three levels. And so this guy asked a question about friends uh, to Dr. Hawkins. And let's hope that this plays. Um, if it doesn't, then I just don't know. Let's listen to it again. Yes. <laughs> I have a question about surrendering. Yeah. Um, seems like um, I have selective surrendering. Some things go away and stay away, and some seem to come back repeatedly. So, why? See, so share my webcam. People can see you. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> I have a question about surrendering. Yeah. Um, seems like um, I have selective surrendering. Some things go away and stay away, and some seem to come back repeatedly. So maybe. Yeah, yeah let's just play it from here. You guys can see that, right? Yeah. Never mind. I'll email you guys a video. Um, he just yeah, because it's about that's another five about five minutes long. But um, he just says this guy's asking a question. You know, like why do we need friends? You know, we need spiritual uh, confidants. We need somebody to reflect questions to, and we need professionals, people experientially. Um, you don't want to go to just anybody that want to talk about stuff, because typically we do. We have problems, we go to our family, and our family is judgmental about the situation, or they side, or friends even side with us. If you talk to somebody, you want to talk with someone who's not going to side with you. You want to talk to somebody who's going to call you out on your own shit. And there was that woman named Jamie Lee, she's a meditation teacher here, who was telling me her daughter is in the situation, and her roommate, you know, they're both they're all 21 or something, and the roommate's just copying her to no end and buying all the same clothes and doing all the same things while her relationship is failing. She's not getting love from her boyfriend, and she's trying to get love from her friends. So she's telling her mom this, and her mom said, talk about shame. Shame on you. <laughs> she, she said, yeah. She goes, you know, you need to give that girl a hug. You know, you need a blah, blah, blah. And she kind of called her out on are misperceptions where it looks like someone's doing something, but what's really going on behind the scenes, you know? And when we have a spiritual confidant, when we have somebody who's not just read the books, and this is the difference between therapy and a spiritual mentor, is a therapist typically reads things out of a book and then just practices them with you. A lot of times they have the experience of knowing how to move you through, um, but to be a spiritual mentor, somebody who's walked through the, through the bullets, so to speak, you know, so not someone who can just reiterate something to you, but experientially, and this is why I, I asked uh, Carl to do the meditation, and I've, I've meditated all the time. Um, I've never been taught. I've just been, I've learned different forms and been to temples and learned little things here, but, you know, I asked him to come because he seems to be more experienced traditionally, you know, meditation than I was, or am. So, uh, to seek spiritual help, you know, and not just a therapist, but also a spiritually based practitioner to, to help with the things, because the scientist is just going to be in the linear objective level. You might have spiritual experiences, you share them with a professional 
psychiatrist or a psychologist and they're going to say, well, your brain produces these, you know, things and it gives off this solution and it does all, all this. No, <laughs> and that's why the therapist I chose was both. She did a lot of spiritual meditation, got a visualization, and these things. So it's really, really important. Um, here are some free resources. Again, let me know if everybody signed in. I have your email, which I know just let everybody know I got your email. Um, let me know, and I can send this to you if you don't already have it. But we have a free 90-day program, Fast Track to Peace, based off of A Course in Miracles. It's Robin Duncan, and. Uh, <clears throat> It's, uh, she, she breaks it into different chunks and categories and different phases of our life and experiences that we have. But it's, I'm on my second time going through it. Uh, the 33 Days in Abundance is more of a financial program. I just completed that uh, about a month or so ago, a few weeks ago. Uh, still based on the Course in Miracles. And then there's 150 prayers. So this is a free prayer book with 150 prayers. And she lists them out for different financial things, so it's not just uh, to, you know, if I'm um, losing my house or, uh, yeah, that, the death, grief, and lots of different, 150 different prayers and different things that we experience. Um, if you wanted to take the Course in Miracles, because it's 365 lessons, there's three parts to the book, the textbook, the lessons, and then the teacher's manual. Um, you can start anytime, but a lot of people, a lot of groups start on January 1st doing the first lesson. And uh, this is the textbook portion. It's all audios. You can download them to your phone and listen to them while you're driving. And they're only like five minutes long. They're not real long. And then these here is the actual lesson part. She'll read the lesson in the book to you, and then she'll give her explanation of how she's experienced that in her life. Um, we do have some things to give away. Let's see. Uh -oh. Yeah, I can email all this. So attendees are still on board. I'm going to unmute and see these people. Are you guys still here with us? You can, don't be shy. Bonnie, are you here? Um, oh, William took off. All right, well, we got some raffle items to give away. Um, the first one is uh, well, Raphael Benjamin kindly donated a free session, and I didn't print it out, but I could email it to you guys. It's one uh, Reiki session in person or distance, or um, to attune to Reiki level one. Is that correct? All right. So what we need to do is uh, and then prepare for this too well. We're just going to rip everybody's names off on the piece of paper. <laughs> I had raffle tickets, and when I moved, I think I left on my right. And I was running around trying to find raffle tickets and all that stuff. So, um, let's see. I got it. We got. Kristen. Bonnie, Sandy, 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 my country boy, um, and you three, and then Bonnie. Okay, Bonnie, if you can hear me, just hang in there. All right, we're going to fold these up. And we've got three things to give away. So we got um, the Reiki session. We have a friend of mine. Um, Reiki. Reiki is Chinese Reiki. energy healing, but he'll he'll explain that. In a, in a minute. Um, then we have a friend of mine who's certified hand, the certified hand analysis. So what? It's not palm reading, you know. It's not those kind of things. It's actually taking a look at your hands. And what she does too, uh, she's in, I don't know, Michigan or something. Uh, she'll send you a package and you take a picture of your hands and you fill out the information and you send it back to her. And she'll give you an analysis on why certain patterns are showing up in your life, uh, love life, financial stuff, business, career, um, lots of different things. So, And then I used to have a nonprofit and a friend of mine donated this. 
to give away, and I uh, dissolved my nonprofit that same year, so I've been carrying it around, waiting for the right opportunity to give it away. And what it is, it's a little plush animal thing, but Scentsy, if you're familiar with Scentsy, it's those uh, fragrances, you know? So there's a little pouch, and you put inside of the thing, and then you know, it smells good when you hug it and stuff. It's not just a stuffed animal in bed, but it's like aromatherapy. aromatherapy. Okay, so um, does anybody have a hat? No? That's all right. We're just going to shuffle these things up, all right, so you guys can see. And I won't, I just hope I don't drop it. Um, okay, so put them down and choose one. This is for the Reiki. And Kristen. Yeah. Congratulations. I'll um, email you the thing, the, the certificate. All right. And then Benjamin's here to talk to you. All right, next is going to be the certified hand analysis. Okay. Benjamin. All right. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> All right. And then for this plush toy. Last, we got Sandy. All right. <laughs> All right. So I think that's it for the presentation. Let's check. No more resources to give away. Um, Yep, that's it. Okay, so thank you guys for showing up. Um, I'm at S for Love Offerings, too. If any of you got value from this and want to donate anything, it's great. If not, no biggie. Um, fortunately, we had um, the whole, you know, this portion being taken care of. And uh, I have a nonprofit I'm looking to start. And... Um, I want to get that going. So whatever can come in through that to get that started, and actually get myself established out here in Oregon would be great. Uh, nothing's required though, so I understand when we don't have it, we don't have it. So if there's something great, if not, keep in touch. Um, I have a relationship education program. I am a spiritual mentor myself too. So if you guys want to work with me, or if you know anybody too who's looking for help in that regard, um, just pass on my information and uh, super grateful that you guys showed up here. Yeah. Thank you guys. You're very welcome.